This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to our Sunset Safari. We are coming to you live from the Juma Concession in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. And I would like to say a very warm welcome uh, to the uh, Sutherland and Newcastle Elementary Schools. Welcome aboard, kiddies. And uh, please, all of you, send your questions through your teacher. Send us your questions and your comments because we'd love for you to be in involved in this uh, uh, biggest game drive of the world. Now, my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera, we've got Viem, a.k.a. Wildebeest. Yes, he's my wingman today, and he's going to be helping me look and find, look for and find lots of animals. Uh, here we've got some kudu and walking through. That's a female kudu. She doesn't have any horns. And we've also got a very big herd of impala here. So now, everybody, these animals, they're always trying to keep away from all the predators. And predators are going to be looking for them, but we're also looking for the predators. And I believe Brent, who's out on foot, has found some for you. Everybody, welcome. You are live with us here at Juma Waterhole, and we have just found two enormous male lions. How exciting is this? It is the first time for me to just bump into male lions. They are coming down to what looks like to have a drink in a very muddy pool of water. And there was a very big buffalo bull rolling around in the mud only a few hours ago. Maybe they're smelling him, they're trying to find him, although his belly does look very, very full. Look at that. He is busy scraping his foot. Did you see that? Doing a bit of a territorial scrape. Oh, he is an enormous, enormous male lion, and he is not alone. But before we get to carry sorry about the break, my name is Steve Falkenbridge. Welcome to the show. I'm joined on camera by the immaculate Craig. And we're coming to you live. Sorry, Sands, where I forget what the temperature is. I think it's about 25 or 26 degrees Celsius. That would make it about 32 degrees Celsius and 89 degrees Fahrenheit. It is a marvelous day, and to get male lions moving like this this early on, is fantastic well we're in a vehicle we feel quite safe let's go to a friend of mine who's watching us on foot yes we're gonna have to change our plan apologies that you couldn't hear me just now we had a little audio issue so we were gonna head down this way to see what the monkeys were an impala were alarming at but of course there's lions and we've got a car there so <laughs> We're not going to walk there now anymore. My name is Brent. I've got my good friend David on camera with me, and Herbie's out keeping us safe. So I think what we're going to do is go look for leopards. So there were some leopard tracks on the other side of camp. So we're going to let Steve enjoy the lions, and we're going to go see if we can find some leopards. Let us go quietly. Okay, so while we sneak away from where the lions are, let's send you back to Steve, who's right next to them. We are, we're thinking about going a little bit closer, but as we sort of get accustomed to they, who they are, I'm not 100% sure who these lions are. I've only seen two male lions before in individual times, and these are not them. So I'm thinking, I'm assuming, which is never good to assume, that these are two of the Birmingham boys, which are two of the dominant males out of a coalition of three, I think. Are there three? There's four of them. Oh, there's four. Maya, you would like to know how big a male lion can get. Well, this individual male lion is probably about almost as big as they get, a few pounds left or right of the scale, and you can assume that this male lion can get up to about 240 or so kilograms. So if you double that, that's over 500 pounds can you imagine 
close to 500 pounds. Can you imagine an animal of that size? Now, it's hard to put it into perspective because it's a little bit far away and he's lying down in the grass. But if you had to put it next to your house cat, it would not be a glimmer of the same size. So they are or can be very, very big. And the thing is, is that when there's four of them, no one's going to mess with them because they are very big and strong. Please send your questions to the teacher. Let us know what you'd like to talk about. Well, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, well, we do have some uh, gremlins sometimes that attack, but never fear, we are out looking for some leopards and everything else in between. This morning, Steve was out in this particular area and there were a lot of leopard tracks, lots of activity of leopards walking up and down. There's males and females, so it's very interesting indeed. And eventually they found an impala that was up in the tree. Now, he didn't fly up there, um, and he didn't jump up there on his own accord either. He was obviously killed by a leopard who was very hungry and needed to eat some meat. And what that leopard was doing then was taking that impala up the tree, push it away to catch it or put it away from other predators that away from other predators that aren't able to climb up the trees like hyena and lions lions can climb up trees they're not very good at it uh, but they can sometimes get up but they're not very good at getting down and sometimes they can actually hang themselves in the tree so lions are quite careful uh, they don't like to go up the trees because it's quite dangerous for them and the hyena Hyenas, well, they don't have claws like the lions and the leopards, so they're more like dogs with um, nails. So they don't um, climb up the trees at all. They will wait around the bottom and see if any of that meat falls down. But very clever are the leopards taking that impala up the tree, and uh, we are going to have a look and see if there's any leopard around there. Now, Rosie. Uh, Leopards, they can run at about 80 kilometers per hour. So that is, what is that? That's about 45 to 50 miles an hour can leopards run. Uh, but they don't do that for very long distance. They are ambush hunters. So they will wait behind a bush and when an impala comes nearby or they will stalk up very close to where the animals are. And when the animal moves in, they will just jump out and uh, um, uh, catch that that animal like that not um, they won't be chasing it down like a cheetah does and a leopard is more of an ambush hunter so that's the way that they hunt very different to the way that lions and cheetah hunt Dawson, I haven't uh, been attacked by any animals. Um, and the reason for that uh, is because I have respect for the animals when I'm out here. Uh, some t I have had uh, a few close calls with animals, I can say that. I've never been attacked. But um, it's when I've surprised some animals, like if I'm driving like this, and there's maybe an elephant that's sleeping behind the tree there because it's very hot and he's relaxing in the shade, and I surprise surprise him um, well we both get a big surprise but sometimes if it's a big bull elephant he might be a little bit grumpy with me so he might uh, get very irritated that I've woken him up and then um, he, he might uh, just chase me away a little bit but he hasn't really attacked me I've also had some lions that have done something similar where they were actually mating and um, they were also a little bit irritated with me because I was invading their privacy. You see, so we need to respect the animals and um, well, respect is what we do. So while we continue looking for these leopards, let's head you on over to Brent who I think is also on the road. We're on our way to where, it's, where the last leopard tracks were this morning, but we're about to leave the road. There's a big animal trail that goes through the bush up ahead here, and that's where we want to go check. There's a water hole about five or six hundred meters through there, and I think that leopard went past there. 
Tyler is wondering, what is the stick that I'm holding? It's just my walking stick, Tyler. It's useful for pointing at things. It's useful for bashing my cameraman when he irritates me. Um, but yes, it's just uh, my walking stick. I picked it up uh, on top of the hill over here. And uh, it was actually broken off a tree by elephants. And I just liked the shape. So I decided I would walk with it. And also, I'm quite fidgety, so it keeps my hands busy instead of doing lots of things. So we're going to see if we can find these leopards now. Right. While we look for leopards, let's send you back to Steve, who's with those big male lions. Yes, we are. Um, something is happening. <laughs> okay, everybody, we are getting close to where there was um, a leopard that took an animal up a tree. Now, I just want to tell you that you are going to see a little bit of bones, so don't be scared, don't be frightened, because this is what the animals, and, and especially predators like leopards and lions, have to eat. But before we see it, if you are scared to see some bones or things like that, just look away now, okay? Because we're going to look at an impala that uh, was taken up a tree by a leopard. So there he is over there, and as I was saying, he didn't fly up there, uh, he was taken up there by a leopard. And that's what leopards do, they'll put it up there in the tree with their very strong uh, claws that they'll be able to climb up. Okay, so that's what leopards feed on, and I know sometimes it's not nice to look at, but um, they are predators and they eat meat, and that is the reality. So. We need to know that that is the way that life works. Now, Messiah, well, I hope that's answered your question. Uh, leopards eat meat, so they eat other animals. So sometimes it's not very nice to watch, but it is real, and that's what happens, okay? So um, they will obviously have to catch an impala like that. They'll have to be very quiet when they're stalking them, and uh, if the impala isn't listening out very much, then uh, the leopard will be able to catch him, and he needs to try and kill it as quickly as possible. So it's also not that bad for the impala it dies very quickly um, and then they will take it up the tree and because that one impala has um, has died uh, uh, the leopards are able to survive now I'm talking about leopards but Steve's got some lions for you Sorry about our technical difficulties there boys and girls but we are back with the lions these are two of the territorial males of sort of this eastern or northern northwestern side of the Sabi Sands and these are two brothers or if not brothers they are very closely related with regards to their sort of coalition and there are four of them normally and these two or four of them have been missing for a couple of weeks uh, exercising their dominion all over the south of the Sabi Sands where there seems to be a lack of male lion presence and that allowed for three young males who don't look nearly as impressive as these guys to pop in to the north and I was just talking about it last night on my walk because the male lions that we've had come in were calling and calling and calling for two days and if that went unanswered this area would be claimed by the new arrivals but now we find these two males and they are looking battle worn and a little bit sore that one in particular that was in the shot he's moved now but he's got a, a gaping wound behind his left eye and behind his right ear there we go the, the, the left eye on the right of the side there he's got a really big hole it looks very very sore and he keeps rubbing it it looks like a very fresh confrontation and I was listening to the radio this morning and one of the guys in the north was tracking a male lion that was running and running and running so no doubt these guys had had some confrontation in the night 
and the youngsters were running away. Aiden, a lion is extremely fast. That individual lion there at charging speed can cover about 22 feet in this or 21 feet in a second when he's running. So if I work that out at top speed, he could probably run about 40, 40 odd miles an hour but they are not designed for distance, they are designed for short bursts of speed and short bursts of energy and um, these two are very big, about as big as they get so they're not as quick as the females but they've got a lot of power behind them Melissa, you want to know if lions are scared of me and well, we're in this big jeep bumbling around it's Marissa, sorry Marissa, it's green, it smells of petrol or gasoline as you would call it and they are not, not afraid of the vehicle but if I climbed out of my car and started walking towards them it would change their behavior because lions have evolved on the African savannas we are in the savanna right now with people so we evolved with them so for very 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 long time uh, they were chased by us so they know who we are when we're standing upright and walking but at night time, it is a different story altogether. They don't have any fear of man at night. And on foot during the day, they will move away from you. Unless they have meat or if it's female with cubs, they might not move away. But at night, it's a different story. They might crouch low and see you as food. Because uh, historically, we didn't spend time walking around at night chasing lions off their food. That's how we first started hunting or got our taste for food was stealing it from bigger predators. But look at that marvelous, impressive mane around his head. M Maya, he's just come from the hairdresser. That's why he has such crazy hair. No, I'm only joking. That big mane of hair around the lion's head serves two purposes. The first purpose is it acts as a cushioning and a protective layer against the neck and throat area when male lions are fighting and confronting each other. It's a very good cushioning because the jugulars in there, the throat and area that if that got cut open, the animal could easily die. And second of all, um, for example, these guys, you see how their mane is brown and there's some dark patches and it's a big, impressive mane. When you see the other males that I'm talking about, they're still a little bit short on the mane. It's not grown over the head properly. And so when one of them see one of these guys, they immediately think, okay, bigger, stronger, more experienced. So they move away rather than fighting. I like to talk about the story of if I walked into a bar or into a shopping center and I saw a big male guy with a, a big man with an enormous beard and full of tattoos, I'm probably going to leave him alone. But if I see a smaller, skinnier guy there, cleanly shaven and neat looking, maybe he's the guy to pick on rather than the big, hairy, scary looking guy. So that's the purpose of the man, to avoid competition and to protect them when they are fighting. Maddie, the lions are so strong. I don't know how to explain it to you. I couldn't actually comprehend it myself, but with their weight and with the power in them, I mean, I say they weigh 450 to 500 pounds. Can you just imagine a human being weighing that, how strong they would be? And lions, equivalently to humans, are stronger. So if you had to make a human being 500 pounds, imagine how strong that person would be and then probably amplify that by about two and that's where the lion comes in because they've got four very powerful legs, a very big barrel chest and claws and teeth all over the place. The animal is designed to pull down big animals like giraffe, buffalo, zebra and when you have a male lion of this size He's very capable of doing that, especially when there's two or three of them. So let's go over and see how the bushwalk team is doing. Oh, welcome back. We're now trying to find the footprints that were seen this morning somewhere in this area. And you can see it's quite difficult to see footprints because the ground's quite hard and there's lots of bushes and stuff. So we're still moving towards a big game path. And when you're on bushwalk, you've got to be much more careful than in the car 
So you've always got to be watching around you and listening. Especially with a windy day like today. But I think the leopards... Well, when I'm tracking leopards, Marissa, I know whether it's a boy or a girl by the size of the footprint. A male leopard footprint is probably about that big. And a female leopard footprint about that big. So the males are much bigger, physically bigger than the females. And if you see them, the males have big, thick necks with thick skin to protect them from when they fight. So you can see we're heading towards some thicker areas now. Now, normally, TK and mom leopard only, only have one or two babies. Sometimes they can have as many as three or four, but normally it's two or one baby at a time. Okay, We're going very quietly through here. You can see now the big animal parts that I want to come check. So let's have a look carefully here where the sand is soft see if we can see any leopard tracks no leopard tracks yet but there's about five or six of these big paths that all join in this area so while I check carefully let's send you back to Steve with those big male lions yes well you're back with us and the one male lion has decided that it was too much for him to sit up his brother though you look at that belly that belly is enormous Enormous. You can get about 80, 90 pounds of meat in there. Imagine that. <laughs> oh, Dawson, you want to know if I've seen a lion catch an impala? I was about to tell you a story to try and hope you help you to understand the power of these lions. And I once saw um, a male impala, or it was a young impala, it was a young male, was stuck in some mud. And two male lions, about the size of these two guys, circled the mud wallow. And eventually one jumped in and grabbed the impala on the back. And as he pulled it out, the other male lion grabbed the impala lower down on the back. And then they fought a tug of war battle, shoulder to shoulder, and they ripped the impala in half. It took about two, maybe three seconds of tug and war, and that impala just separated in the middle. So that is enormous power, enormous, enormous power. And then they went off to eat their half impala on their own. And it was just a morsel for them, just a snack. But we were talking about the mane before. Have a look at that individual there. He's gone. Let's see, so if we look at the one on the right, um, Craigo, have a look at how the grass is not very tall there, boys and girls, and that male lion has disappeared. Can you give me that name again, please, Kirst? Jay Zion, you want to know if lions, male lions, catch cheetah? They will. They will kill them if they can. Uh, lions will take exception to any predator they see, including other predators uh, such as lions. So they'll take, if they see a lion they don't know, a male, they will fight it to kill it if they can. If they find lionesses that they don't know, they might go in to try and mate. Those females might fight them off. They might kill them. That does happen. But anything else, a leopard, a cheetah, a wild dog, a lion will kill, if they can, if they can catch them. Uh, same with hyena. It is all competition out here. We call it intra-specific competition uh, because it's between the species um, and it's all about food. They all have a similar sort of food resource that they go for in the African wilderness. And if either of them, any of them, catch the cubs of another one, they will kill them. They're probably the most docile of them all is the cheetah. The cheetah doesn't seem to affect the other predators too much, including their cubs. But all of the others, if they come across the cubs or pups of one of the others, will kill them. Because that is it's sort of soldiers coming forward or future kings coming forward. So they'd rather eliminate them before they get strong, big and strong. And male lions are very good at doing that. <laughs> Michael, you want to know if lions share their kills. Now, it really depends on who is with them. I have seen a male lion with a pride of lions, and he has allowed the cubs to feed with him. 
but any of the females come near and he smashes them away. Um, but then I've also seen females share with cubs. Then I've also seen females smash the cubs away. Uh, but often male lions will steal all the food for themselves against the females and males will feed together but very aggressively. Um, it's part and parcel of being a lion really. Uh, from the age of being a cub they compete to suckle so they're competing all the time from the day they're born and those who cannot compete just even on mother's milk will not make it to adulthood they will not succeed so it's part and parcel of being a lion is competing but quite often the males will steal the food from the females who will then go off and hunt again leaving the fat and lazy male lions behind And that is only half as full as I've seen a belly. Okay, well, it looks like the bushwalk team has managed to find something of interest. So let's go and see what it is. <laughs> we had a ladybug, but that flew away. But we have found that leopard tracks we're looking for. Now, as I say, it's on one of the big game paths I thought it might be on. But you can see how difficult it is to follow leopard footprints. So there we go. You got one, two, three, four toes there, and then this is the back pad here. So she's moved through here, so probably early this morning. So she might have slept for the day, or she could have kept moving. So we're going to try and now figure out where she's gone next. Now, yes, Caleb, uh, a full-grown lion would definitely beat a full-grown leopard um, and a full-grown female lion would beat a full-grown female leopard. Lions are much bigger. A big male lion like you're looking at there with Steve, he probably weighs 450 pounds. A big male leopard weighs 180 to 200 pounds. So the leopards stand no chance. The lions are much bigger, much stronger. Okay, let's keep sneaking along, looking where her footprints go. Okay, so it looks like she's gone up here can just make out some footprints in the sand so we're going to go very carefully and quietly along here hopefully we're going to find her while we do that let's go across to Ralph to see what he's looking for now so everybody we um, we're back with some impala and this is a nice male impala and he's trying to establish some dominance because this is the time of year when all the males are fighting with each other and uh, when when you get a challenger that wins then he is going to be taking all the girls for himself so there's lots of fighting going on between all the male impala at the moment and they're all making a very funny noise as well they're making like a and so there's lots of noises that they're making, lots of fighting, and uh, it's that time of year when they when they start to do this, when we have the days getting shorter, so we're in autumn and we're going towards winter. Mrs. Min Impala run probably at about uh, top speed, maybe 35, 40 miles an hour, maybe a little bit faster than that. But uh, their biggest, uh, their best way to get away from a predator is going through the thick bush. They're very agile and they can jump over big bushes and, they, and run between them. So that's what they'll do if a predator tries to catch them. But uh, they also just like to feed on all sorts of things as well so they're quite uh, able to live in all sorts of different environments and they're very adaptable and that's what makes impala very special and that's why there's so many of them because they can live in very different environments Now, Mrs. Pagan, well, it's very interesting, that question that you're asking, because all gazelle are antelope, but not all antelope are gazelle. 
Now, that sounds very strange, doesn't it? But um, you get quite a few different um, gazelle, and it's, it's, it's quite um, the real definition is down to their sort of uh, horn shape. And, um, well, you get the Thompson's gazelle, the Grant's gazelle. They are antelope, but these um, impala are not gazelle they are antelope as well so it's like a different type of um, it's it's a if i can say a small group of antelope or gazelle so the gazelle no i'm saying it the wrong way around a small group of gazelle or antelope now we're getting confused, aren't we? So, in other words, all the gazelle and the impala and the springbok and all the rest, they are all part of the bigger group of antelope. So, gazelle are just a small group uh, within the group of antelope, if I can say that. It can get quite confusing, doesn't it? But uh, gazelle are not all these animals, like you would see here. Now, TK, those lines on the horns of the impala are actually as they are twisting. So you have a look at that male there. They're, they're actually spirals as it starts to go up. And that's what we call the tragalophene uh, type antelope. All the antelope that have horns that are twisting, they're turning around. Now, just watch him. You see, he's... You see that noise that he's making? And that's the noise that he's making towards other males. You see there? He's telling those other males that he's boss or he wants to be boss. And he's looking for a fight. So those ridges or lines on the horns are part of the spiral, how it's turning, and that's how it grows. So as it grows, there becomes more and more of those little twists, and then you get the, each different line uh, showing through. Now you see, all he's interested in is fighting. And that's what all these antelope are interested in. All the males, all they want to do now is fight with each other and see who's the strongest of the lot. And they're all making very funny noises, aren't they? Tristan and Olivia, uh, if I can say that Impala are about as tall as, um, if, if you're in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, well, you probably get some uh, types of deer. And they, Impala are not huge. They're quite small, but they're probably the size of... Um, a very big dog, like a Great Dane, or, or the size of a, of a medium-sized deer, like a fallow deer, if I can say that, or the size of, you know, like Bambi-type uh, deer with the, with the spots on them. That's, that's the kind of size that I'm talking about. So, I wonder, these males are now going to continue fighting over here, but I think we're going to just go looking for some other animals. They're very exciting. Let's see what we can find. But while we do that, let's head you on over to Steve, who I think's got something uh, fast asleep. Yes, indeed, this is a wildebeest that is lying flat. I've never seen a wildebeest lying so flat. There's a whole herd of them here, and the rest of them are sitting how they normally sit. And you can see he's still alive. The rest of them are sitting with their legs tucked up underneath them. The typical posture of a ruminating animal. Well, a ruminating animal is like a cow or a sheep. They have four chambered stomach, and they're able to... There we go. He's back up again. And they do what we call regurgitating the cud and chewing the cud, and then actually allows them to sleep. Now, this, these are a bunch of animals that I have no doubt the lions that we have just left down in the, the, the river area would really like to come after. Maddie, you'd like to know what the main food chain is. Well, you know, it is a, an amazing thing. The food chain is enormous. First of all, all these wildebeest are sitting on the ground, the soil underneath, which provides the nutrients for the grass that is being sat on by these wildebeest but these wildebeest and the impala and the nyala and lots of other animals you might see feed on the grass 
and then they in turn will defecate so they will actually poo and urinate on the ground um, and that will go back into the soil but then at the same time lions and leopards will also feed on these individuals at different stages and the same thing will happen the lions and leopards will also defecate and urinate and all the animals eventually will die and all their nutrients will go back into the soil but essentially the food chain goes from the plants the trees and the grasses to the grazing and browsing animals including the giraffe with a very tall neck and then the predators would be the cheetah and the hyena hyena could also be under a scavenger and then the lion would be right up on top there as what we call an apex predator being a very dominant predator in the area but uh, the leopard does very very well because they have the ability to climb into the trees with whatever morsel of food they have caught beautiful herd of wildebeest Raika, it's a very interesting question there you want to know why the wildebeest have horns and the major reason is is that not only the female the males but the females also have horns so with the impala you saw there with ralph you saw that they were probably fighting the males used the horns for fighting against other males for the right to mate and because the wildebeest are what we call an open plain specialist they like to live in the open area because they feed on grass their defense against predators is to turn and chase them away with the horns so when they have babies lions and hyena and cheetah try and take their babies as well as jackal and so the parents can turn around and defend their youngsters against the the predator that's trying to kill them that is the major reason why the females have the horns and then obviously the males have the horns a little bit bigger for the pr purpose of fighting and competing for the rights to the ladies Well, it seems like Brent is on a proper tracking mission this afternoon. Let's go over and see what else he's found. Well, I found a track of the same leopard we've been following, just in much softer sand. So I've just drawn it in a little bit so you guys can see what the shape of the track. And I've made it a little bit bigger. So there we go. So, and she's a female leopard. She's been hunting through here. So often we can go quite a long way without seeing tracks. I can see where she's come from here, and she was here, and she's there, and she's gone here, and she's headed off that way. So what, often in these situations we have to think like a leopard. We've got to think, if I was a leopard and I was hungry and I was hunting, I wouldn't walk in a straight line. I've got a zig and zag, and leopards like to hunt in thick areas like this that give them a lot of camouflage. And also some of their favorite food likes to live there, like Inyala and Bushbuck. So what she's done is she's zigzagged through these thickets and now she's headed off that way. So we're still hot on her trail and hopefully we're going to be able to find her soon. So if we go over here, you can see where she goes. And now I'm going to show you how difficult a track can be. Now where was the one we saw over here? It's just over here. There, thanks, Herb. There's the one we saw a bit earlier. Look at that. Now that is a leopard. That is a leopard track. So you can see how tough it is to see. So that's why we've got to go slowly and carefully while we're tracking. Okay. I'm going to keep looking for this leopard. In the meantime, let's send you back to Steve. Well, we have not moved off from the wildebeest because they are a marvelous bunch of herbivores and they are still relaxing that youngster you see on the right hand side is only a few months old was born in december and there are one two three four five six of them still so they've done very well landon you know how long wildebeest live in i would estimate in the wild between probably between nine and maybe 15 years i don't know exactly but Naturally, that should probably be about the ballpark figure of their age. Uh, males might get a bit older, some of them. Territorial males might get up to the ages of 12, 13, somewhere around there. The females in a herd can maybe get a bit, bit older than that as well. It all depends really if they get eaten or if they evade predation. 
and this herd likes to hang out in these open areas so they can run away from the lions if need be and as I was going to say these little youngsters is all six of them we saw six of them born in December uh, we actually some one of my fellow presenters managed to record that live I think two people recorded it live live wildebeer's birth on Safari live how interesting but you can see them just sitting there and busy chewing you've probably seen that before in animals you might have at home a goat or a sheep or a, a cow for example and they're busy chewing to maximize the benefit they can get out of the vegetation Delaney you want to know what wildebeest fur feels like I have no idea I have never felt one to be honest but it looks rather nice doesn't it looks rather smooth I really have no idea. Craig, have you ever felt a wildebeest? No, I haven't. I have no idea, Delaney. It looks rather smooth, but I reckon it's rather smelly as well, because they don't bath, and the male likes to rub himself on the females, but only after he's rolled in his own poo. So isn't that a marvelous way to tell your lady that you love her, to roll all over poo and then rub it on her? So we're not going to be touching these wildebeest anytime soon, as marvelous as they might seem. They are 100% wild animals, and if I got out of the car now and walked towards them, they would run away. We don't want to disturb them like that. Poor creatures. Malachi, that's about as big as they get. I'd say a male gets up to about 250 kilograms, so that's about the same sort of weight as the maximum you could get for a male lion. So enormous, in fact, but you can imagine a male lion trying to pull one of these down. They do it with ease. Even though a male wildebeest can probably be about the same sort of size, they do not have the power. They're built more for long distance and speed. I'm just being called on the radio, folks, so if you just hold on for a second. Standing by. Hi, Patsy. I just left them, but they are in the middle of the dam. Last I left them a few minutes ago, lying down. Copied. So we use a radio out here, boys and girls, so that we can maximize the, the footprint that we have out here. And, for example, Ralph and Brent and myself, we're all connected with the radio, so we know what the other one's doing, where they're going. So we're able to find and communicate. Like Brent, for example, might find some tracks, and they might be heading in a in an easty direction, and we can maybe come around and check a road. Uh, for example, that's a landowner from the north who's calling to find out about those lions that you got to see first. And they want to come have a look so we get to share with those people and they get to share with us as well so that helps us to to maximize as many areas as we can go mrs hilton very good question you want to know why do animals try to establish dominance a lot of it's got to do with mating uh, you often find it in young males they might establish dominance over other males so that they can rise up the pecking order and then eventually become the dominant male and the dominant male in an area will be the one who breeds and the strongest male will be the dominant male and survival of the fittest means not only being the strongest and the fittest but being able to successfully reproduce so that's what all dominance is about about is about getting the genes forward to the next generation whether the male survives that season or not is debatable but through his behavior his genetics will move forward because he's been able to sort of dominate those around him we're seeing that with the impala at the moment we do see it with the wildebeest as well uh, lions will do it to each other leopards will do it to each other it's all about the genetic sort of structure and moving forward in the dynamics of who these species are and that's how they've evolved to be as strong as they are and if they didn't do that they'd probably peter out and disappear as a species altogether i hope that answers your question and they are not looking very dominant at the moment they are looking very relaxed so we're going to move off and see what else we can find in this early afternoon in Juma in the Savi Sands and please keep sending your questions through you've sent some phenomenal ones so far Bye bye, wildebeest. And if you were wondering, and so 
Boys and girls, two schools are joining us. Thank you so much for the afternoon. It's been wonderful. I'm glad we could show you what we showed you. I hope you learned something. Thank you for joining us. Please do so again. Tell your friends. And on that note, we're going to say goodbye to you two, and then we're going to go back over to Ralph. Thanks, Steve, and well, that was wonderful having the schools with us. Now, welcome back to all our regular viewers, and please don't forget to join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Send us your questions and your comments because we'd love for you to be involved. Um, and we'd love for you to be involved on our search here for uh, our spotted cats. There's been so much activity around, but I tell you what, they are giving us the slip all over the place because we've seen it must be at least four or five leopard tracks circling around camp and Tandi and Tlalamba this morning out near to Drakensberg Road all the way up towards Torchwood that's right up in the northeastern side and so there's so much movement that we can see by the tracks but nobody's been able to spot one of them so I'm just coming down one of these roads heading towards Zoe's Rebecca's and uh, well for now a little bit quiet but it is only the start of the drive so we'll just keep on keeping on and hopefully we'll find something speaking of finding something seems like Brent has done just that We've got a beautiful big female golden orb spider. Isn't she stunning? Now she got a bit of a fright from us, so she's moved right to the edge of the web and is keeping very, very still. And while she's doing that, the male is making the most of it, and he's scurrying around the web, the, the web, the web very quickly he actually oh, oh he's so quick i've lost sight of him and he was trying to grab something to eat you see the male where's he gone he was oh there he is down the other side of the web coming towards us there is a male golden orb you can see tiny in comparison to the female it's quite a dangerous job being a male got got a golden orb web spider because if you you don't tickle her tummy right when it comes time to produce babies you become dinner okay. very cool and then there's actually a, an oh look at that little kleptoparasite there Dave when it's moving with this bright sunshine you just catching that mercury silver on this side here that one there oh now you'll see when it turns you just get this incredible a f incredible sort of quick there we go you got it there Dave it's so windy unfortunately that that bright bright sort of almost mercury it is it looks like mercury and they like quicksilver they are they're called dewdrop spiders or or mercury spiders sometimes but the proper name is a dewdrop spider and they are little kleptoparasites that live on the webs of big much bigger spiders and eat tiny fragments of food oh the wind is too much <laughs> and they eat tiny fragments of food that is left behind by the bigger spider species and she is still up there uh, in this case here Bobby actually both male and female venomous all true spiders have venom glands, but, oh, he's getting brave, Dave. Here comes the male. Oh, oh, the male nearly got eaten. Oh, look at him. He parachuted. That was incredible. So he got too close to her. Oh, he's, he's coming up again, and he actually parachuted, so he just jumped off. Uh, oh, she's, she's on the hunt. You see well, how danger it is to, dangerous it is to be a male spider. Here she comes. Uh-oh. Move, dude, move! <laughs> she doesn't want to make babies with you right now. She wants to eat you. She can feel uh, of sort of which strand he's on. So you can see how she's coming across. Keeping, she's uh, still on his tail. Move, Mr. Move! Uh, it looks like he's kept still and she's lost his, 
lost which strand he was on. But she's heading back down now. She might start feeding off her stash. Now, you can see it looks like a moth. Oh, the wind. Moth or butterfly just below her. And it looks like quite a fresh kill. There we go. She's got it there now. So in a lot of cases, spider venom will help liquefy the insides of whatever they want to eat. And then they sort of have a, oh, how would you call this, a, a bug smoothie to slurp on, and which is what she's doing right now. So she's obviously bitten it earlier, wrapped it in silk. Now it's come down for her afternoon tea. And you can see she might have eaten. She's uh, eating it now. Isn't that incredible? And it's so wonderful to be able to spend time at these orb spiders' webs because if you, you spend enough time here, there's always a bit of action. And she's eaten, by the looks of things, a fair share of blowflies. I'm just trying to see in her long line of debris. Oh, she got a fright again. Jamie, uh, she's probably about five centimeters. I mean, she's right on the edge there. I'm going to go around. I don't want to damage her, her web. And so I'm going to have to just go around like this. And to give you an idea of how big she is, to my hand. Now, even though she's venomous, she's completely harmless to human beings. There we go. Sorry, big girl. Now, as I was just saying, we're not done here yet. I need to get it. Uh, deadhead Tom, yes, it's possible that spiders would eat their young, or, or other. Okay, now, as I said, I'm going to go, go around again. I don't want to damage her web, and I can see, uh, with the light coming through, I can see where I can stand without damaging. Now, Dave, let's have a, a look. You see this long line of there? You can see there's some very shiny metallic. So those are from uh, blowflies. So the, the flies you see around carcasses quite a lot. There looks to be a small dung beetle in there as well, down at the base here somewhere. I can't see it from this side. So the reason they keep all the sort of carcasses after they've sucked the living daylights out of them is they put them in a long line like this, and this stops birds flying through their, their, their webs. So it's actually a, a warning thing. Oh, come, come look at it. Oh, she's, she's, she's doing well. She's got, this one's still alive. Uh, it looks like a type of horsefly almost there. That one's still alive. So she's got a couple of different meals oops, waiting for her. And there's another meal over there. I can't really see where that one is. But, yeah, so she's done very well. So she snacked on the one, but she's still got a couple of meals left. I was just hoping... Oh, there we go. Okay. Look at that. There's a little dewdrop spider. There we go. You can see how small the dewdrop spiders are compared to the big female. That's how they are. Oh, there, did you see that one there? Because it's, it's quite still. You can just see that mercury shine. Oh, isn't that magic? Oh, look, it's it's kleptoparasitizing on the same thing that the, the big female was just feeding on. Now, they're generally small enough to escape from the female when she ca f catches them doing that. Now, they will move webs. Uh, depending, especially if they've put the web, especially if it's in, on a big game path or whatnot and keeps getting broken down, they will move their webs. Uh, Monique, the reason those dewdrop spiders are so shiny is they actually mimic dewdrops on the, on the web. So it's a form of camouflage against the big female. Oh, look how pretty it is. Wind, stop it now so we can look at this properly. Sure. It is amazing when you take time to look at the little things.
Now, of course, you, everything else gets stuck in a spider's web, except spiders. Now, Paula, it's, their feet are specially designed not to get stuck on the adhesive. Oh, she's figured out that something's trying to eat her thing. She's charging in again. Dewdrop, are you going to be an unlucky? Are you going to get caught out? Or are you going to skedaddle in time? What the, often what the dewdrop spiders will do when the big female gets too close to them is they literally just drop off the, off the web completely. Look, he's stolen it, taking it out to the peripheries. Clever little fella. Looks like a little moth. Yeah, heading back. Seems to be spinning a little web of his own. So he can try and get this morsel away from the the queen of the web. But wow, wasn't that wonderful? Wonderful camera work by Dave. I know it's tough in the wind. <laughs> uh, but a lovely distraction while we're looking for Shadulu. So we're going to keep looking for Shadulu. In the meantime, we're going to see what Ralph, where Ralph is and what he's up to. Thanks, Brent. Well, we actually come around again. We've done a couple of little loops uh, because, as I was saying earlier, lots of leopard activity. And so now we are going to go look at the little Galago pan, which is just around the back here because Hosanna has been hanging around this area. It seems we've got a female tracks that are coming through here seems like it might be shudulu um, we haven't been able to find her we went to impala plains where she likes to hang out as well um, so no spotting of the spotted cats just yet they're eluding us for now but uh, it's starting to get towards that later afternoon where they might start to walk around a little bit and maybe show themselves because as you know with these leopards if they're lying down in the thick grass it's almost impossible to see them and sometimes literally just a meter away from you and uh, you wouldn't see them at all so well we just got to keep driving around and that's what I've been doing now since the start of the drive we haven't stopped and we're not going to until we find something exciting it's not only about the leopards but uh, while we're driving around I'm sure we'll spot something else as we go along the way what would you like to see everybody you send through what you would like to see obviously I would love to see things like porcupine and honey badgers and art fox but uh, they are quite difficult to see I would love to see those kind of animals but uh, if we see a giraffe we'll stop for that if we see anything else exciting we'll We'll stop and have a look and open up the debate and chat about it. So remember us as guides, we're not vets, we're not doctors, we're not uh, specialists in uh, all these different fields. What we are good at is driving and finding things and then opening up the debate. And from our experience, we can then chat about it. Now, well, dear, I don't know if you can get a view on that. A little bit forward. There he is. That's an African hoopoe. Nice little spot. And he's got that lovely crest on the back of his head. He hasn't opened it for now. And that's one of the conservation emblems that we have in South Africa. Is the African hoopoe. I believe in Europe, where they also have them, they call them the European hoopoe. But it, I think it's exactly the same bird. I think the Latin name is the same, but the common name is different in the two continents. A very long um, curved bill. They use that for probing into the soil. They do get all sorts of little worms and things. There, he's flown off. So, as I say, that's what we'll do. We'll stop for all sorts. And that was a very nice little shot of an African hoopoe. Larry, <laughs> I'd also love to see a stampeding herd of uh, African giant land snails. Um, and we might get some with this weather that we're having. It seems there is a possibility we might have a little bit of a storm. So if we get lots of rain, we might in fact get some of those snails all in a line stampeding across the road. Um, but for now, it's a little bit dry. 
and lots of requests coming through for elephants. I will do my best. Let's see. As I say, it's, I've only found one herd of elephants since I've been back. Um, the marula trees have all finished with their fruiting, so there's not too much keeping them in the area here on Juma. They seem to be fleeting uh, sort of visits that we get as they come through. But uh, that's not to say that we won't see any elephants. There are signs of them being around. And so, well, with all those requests, and you know, I love being with the elephants, so. Lily, who is seven years old, I think Steve might be going over to Chitwa Dam, uh, um, and uh, I stand corrected, but uh, he was thinking of doing that, and if he does, well, we'll pass on the message for him to show you an African fish eagle up there because there's a resident pair of African fish eagles over at Chitwa Dam and if he heads that way that will be perfect for you. What are we gonna find? Here we are in the area where there was a um, active hyena den site. I'm just gonna go down this little two track because there's been so much activity of leopard around we want to go and look down all these secret little roads and how do we look for, look for leopards well we look for their tracks we look for anything hanging in the tree we look for a little ear flick maybe a white tip of the tail that's what we're looking for and we're looking now probably in the shade because that's where they'll be on a nice hot afternoon like we had today sort of almost hitting the 90s Fahrenheit and uh, 32 or so 32 33 degrees Celsius so not not a cool afternoon at all a very warm day it was indeed so as I say, it's starting to cool off a little bit now, but um, we might just get a chance that the leopards maybe have been lying up in the shade while it was very hot. And maybe they'll start moving now, go for a drink, and then uh, maybe go to mark their territories, and then also maybe go for a little hunt. Now, speaking of it being very hot, well, I can imagine it must be quite tiring for the guys out on the bushwalk. Uh, let's go over to Brent and see if he's surviving. Of course we're surviving. We found another really interesting little critter. Now, I don't know if you can see there. Oh, he moved down slightly. That is a tiny little caterpillar. I'm not sure what species of moth or butterfly, probably moth, uh, that it comes from. Now, you can see there's also silk around there. So spiders aren't the only creatures that spin silk. Caterpillars do as well. And they've actually spun all over the place and when we spotted it it was feeding on this leaf over here you can see this big chunk out and there's actually about five or six of them if you look carefully carefully throughout this little silk and it seems like they started over here somewhere to the to the somewhere around here you can see this is where they maybe where they're born and they've slowly but surely co congregated stuff and they've made themselves a bridge across to this ch little baby uh, combresum that they're feeding on and then they've gone across through there and back across and to another combretum oh there's some more of them in here that they're also feeding on same species of red bush willow or same species of tree that they're feeding on red bush willow but very very cool they're tiny and they're quite quick for a caterpillar as you see if I put my little grass stick near them he moves quite quickly, then keeps dead still, trying to pretend to be a little twig, so nothing will eat him. Now we are hoping still to get some luck with the, the lovely little Shadilu, but she is proven to be elusive because she's hunting, so she's zigzagging through this area. So we're checking one of her favorite spots, the termite mound, and we haven't had any luck there. Now, as you can see, Lynn, I carry the biggest backpack in the world. No. Uh, so Lynn's asking what is important to carry in a backpack when going on a bushwalk. Well, Lynn, it completely depends on what type of bushwalk you're doing. Uh, if you're going on a hike and whatnot, it's important to carry lots of stuff. I know I'm not going 
more than probably about seven or eight kilometers on these walks. So I carry very little apart from my stick and my binoculars and a knife is all I carry. But in um, Herbie's backpack, um, there's a first aid kit. There's water if we need it. Uh, but if, you, if I was going on an extended bushwalk by myself for a full day, I would take mostly water. And uh, that's pretty much it. Water, um, that's what I take with me. And uh, the rest, my binoculars and my stick and my knife, I'll just carry on me. So we're heading up towards the shortcut off Gallagher shortcut. The shortcut off the shortcut to see if we find any tracks of her coming out through here. Okay, while we keep moving, let's send you back to Ralphie boy. Well, we're just stopping here just to have a look at this little red-billed hornbill. It's flown off onto the top of the tree there. They, for me, honestly look like the the unfortunate stepbrother of the yellow-billed hornbill because they don't quite look like they fully developed that little bill of theirs, don't they? And uh, he's just flown off over there. But let's uh, let's carry on the search. But uh, yeah, as I say, the the unfortunate younger stepbrother of the yellow-billed hornbill. He's the, the protege. What else can we find? It's quite calm. There's, there's a little bit of a breeze picking up now. A bit of cloud cover, so it's actually sort of cooling off quite nicely now, and I'm getting a good feeling about this. What have we got here? Look at that in front. What do you know? We've got another African hoopoe. There he is. It's a day for hoopoos. And the reason he's called a hoopoo is because of the call. He does a whoop whoop, whoop whoop, whoop whoop. We can hear all sorts of other little birds. There's a Koki Franklin calling now. That's what I always say with her. <laughs> really, they are very sweet little birds, aren't they? The little hoopoos. And they do go around probing in the soft sand, and looking for little worms and things in the soil. That's why they've got that long bill of theirs, but very sharp, almost like a miniature hardy dar, if I can say, because they, they walk around very similar type of feeding action that they have as the hardy dar ibis. The hardy dar ibis has got a very long bill to it. Now, Tom, uh, the reason, well, there's a lot of sort of long beaks um, of, of the birds around here because, um, well, if you're trying to probe into into the ground uh, or in the water, you need to have quite a long bill to be able to get uh, to your prey. And the other reason is, like for instance with the uh, sunbirds, they need to have a nice long bill so they can access the nectar that they're looking for in the flowers. And if you look at the bee eaters, for instance, they have a long bill because they catch insects, but a lot of those insects have got sting, stings or stingers on them that uh, they want to keep that insect away from the eyes, which are quite vulnerable. So they'll then have a nice long bill so they can scratch the stinger off before they swallow it down. So that's also a lot, a lot to do with you know safety. Keeping the eyes safe, whatever you catch can be nice and far away from your eyes as well as giving you nice long reach to either probe or catch fish or frogs or whatever it might be. So it's all evolved in terms of what they want to eat. We're just coming up now towards Nilwati. Now, Ravinda, ooh, there goes a little daker across the tree, uh, across the road. Um, now, Ravinda, you wanted to know if uh, um, one of the birds uh, pick 
trees like the woodpecker um, and, I'm, and I'm thinking you're talking about the hoopoe they don't um, they don't pick trees like that because woodpecker is very very well adapted to that and they've actually got special sponges at the base of their bill that um, stops the, the the impact from hitting a solid um, surface uh, from actually giving itself concussion so a hoopoe hasn't got that sponge at the base of its bill so if it had to hit a solid surface like the woodpeckers do it would do itself quite a nasty injury so that's the reason they they sort of probe more in soft surfaces like in the ground like potentially next to a water hole um, where there might be some worms and all sorts of little grubs but just below the surface of the soil that's where they generally probe so quite different to that of the woodpeckers. See how they're all totally um, evolved differently. Now we're coming up here to Voyotella Dam. I'm going to pop in here and have a look at these lions because I haven't seen them and uh, I know Steve has moved off, he was having a look, but uh, let's get in and have a good view. And while we do that, off to Brent. I wonder how he's going on foot. Well, we're back on Shadulu's tracks. Still heading north, and unfortunately, we're getting quite close to the Buffalo's Hook boundary. So, we're still on her tracks. She's still heading north. There's a tractor, you might hear, going past us in the, in the distance. Might be doing some maintenance on the road. Now, it's always tough. I mean, we started on these tracks probably six hours behind them maybe even a seven hours and um, so there's always a chance though that she's caught something and she hasn't kept moving there she goes there. Uh, Victor the last time wild dogs were seen was a couple of days ago uh, Ralph I think saw them no bushwalk saw them um, and then on Monday, when I went to drop my brother off back at Chitwa uh, at work, I saw wild dogs on my way back. But by the afternoon, safari, <coughs> gone. I wouldn't mind a bit of wild dog on foot today. That would be, that would make my afternoon, it would. Are we just keeping, there we go. Sis. Now, I'm going to ask, what is that? Hashtag Safari Live if you know the answer. What is that poop? Hashtag Safari Live if you know what made that poop. I'm not going to touch it. David, would you like to touch it? Nah. Okay, we're getting quite close to the boundary again, so we're going to have a look. And... Uh, see if she went straight north or if maybe she sometimes loops up the fire break and turns in at sandy patch okay i'm going to try and see where she is going here now as the road gets a bit more difficult and while we do that let us go to steve and a water buck We've got a water buck who's hanging out with some other very special animals, and this is not a Shadulu Kudu. <laughs> Sorry, that came out wrong. But it's a Shadulu Kudu who's on top of the termite mound. It's marvelous. I've never seen that before. Getting a bird's eye view of what is what dangers there might be in and around. He's also looking down at a possible consort. There's a male kudu that's just walking past the other side. I'm terribly sorry about the signal issues we've had for the last little while. There's the male just materializing behind. Sorry about the back of the car folks. He has clearly got something on the mind. He's busy sniffing that female as she's defecating. He's going to probably do a phlegm and grimace. Sorry about the aerial we have behind there. Marvelous to see a kudu perched so high up on the landscape with the ox pickers in tow
Maybe she's tired of the male's interests and so thought if she got elevated, he would leave her alone. Seems to have done the trick. It is indeed. Eric the poet indeed is posing for an artist's palette. I've never seen a kudu do this before. There's no purpose to go up on there unless there was a bush. Because the kudus are browsers, not grazers. So if there was a tree or anything on there growing out the termite mound, I can understand the purpose for going up there. But maybe just gone up for a little bit of a view. I think a lot of it's to do with the get away from that, the interests of that not fully mature male. And he's disappeared from view now. I do apologize. I'm being called by Herbie on the radio, so if you'll just excuse me for a moment. Standing by. Twin dance. Okay, Cobbett Herbie, where would you like me to go? He's got tracks of wild dog. Okay, Cobby, we'll make our way there. He has got tracks of wild dog towards the west. So we go see if we can make a plan. But it looks like Ralph has snuck in there and stolen our lion, so let's go over to him. Well, we're sitting here with the sleeping lions at Vuyatilla Dam, doing what they do best, lying around. And you can see this male panting quite nicely. He looks like he might have a bit of a belly on him. I wonder when they fed last. That does look like he's got a bit of a big belly with some food in it. But uh, I could be wrong. It might just be the angle. His... Uh, Companion is lying in the grass and, and very flat. We can hardly see him. There he is. And um, Kirsten's telling me that's the one that's injured. So we can't really see him from this angle. But we're up on the damn wall, so we've got a little bit of a view down over them. I thought I'd start off over here. And we might pop around the front of them, especially if they get up or do something. But it might be quite interesting a little bit later, once uh, the sun heads towards the horizon. Maybe they'll get up and, and give us a roar or something like that. Might be quite nice. But uh, nice to have lions so near to camp. We're literally just about 500 meters away from here, where we sleep. And uh, well, we have lions, we have elephants, we have leopards walking right past our camp. Okay, these lines are very flat. I think we need to move on and find some other animals. Oh, hello. Is he waking up or is he just going to roll over? Go on. Oh, look at that fat belly. Ah, that's a big stretch. Oh, wow. That was quite difficult. Okay, let's, um, let's head you on off to Brent and we'll relocate. Wow. Someone just asked about wild dogs, and it seems like we missed out because there were wild dogs here today. So there's wild dog tracks all over here as we've just gone a little bit further down. We've got no more leopard tracks, but they've been replaced by wild dog tracks all over the road here. So <laughs> we're probably going to still keep tracking the leopard because trying to track a wild dog is probably comparative to... Well, this, this analogy will only work for the fisherman. Trying to catch a tarpon with a, 20, a size 21 dry fly, uh, it's just not going to happen. Now, you can track them from a vehicle, but on foot, they move <laughs> too quickly. Kirsten says, good one. I don't think, unless you're a fisherman, uh, no one is going to understand <laughs> that analogy. Um, trying to catch a Formula One race car in a 1962 VW Beetle. <laughs> it's probably a better one that more people understand. 
and I've got sarcasm in my ear this afternoon from 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 Kirsten. Ah, Ravinda, it is not a honey badger poop that we saw just now. So, not a honey badger. It is a poop I would not touch. There we go, there's another wild dog track here. Uh, not a jackal lily, but you're getting closer. Let's see. Where did the puppies go? Well done, Richard and P. Hart. This is indeed a very runny leopard poop from this morning. So, uh, probably from Shadulu, uh, but very, very runny. Aha! <laughs> Origin, yes, a leopard on a jet ski. Now, this has been worked on today, so these dogs are, have been here in the last couple of hours because you can see the tractor's been here today. There's no other real tracks except for the wild dog Tr trotting along here. Trot, 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 trot. There we go. All around here. Dogs, dogs, everywhere. Okay, Ooh, these are looking better. They might have been sleeping in here uh, during the day. Okay, we're going to try be the VW Beetle to catch the Ferrari Formula One vehicle. And <laughs> we can only try. And in the meantime, we sent to Steve, who we've sent to go check up ahead of us. Oh, those gremlins strike again. Well, Steve, I wonder what you're doing wrong that uh, that keeps coming your way, but I'm sure the, the guys will sort it out soon. We've just come uh, down this little secret road that uh, goes down into the Mlawati because, well, we didn't get anything amazingly um, promising around up top where the guys were. We just had a look in at those lions, but as I said, they're sleeping for now. So let's go and see what else we can find in the meantime. I'm sure they're not going to be going too far. Whoops, there's a big log. Sorry about that. Oopsie. Get the back tire over it. There we go. Okay, so we're coming down through the Milwaukee. And see, as the day was very hot today, nice and cool down here, so every opportunity that a cat might be resting up down here in the shade. Like Steve said this morning, I agree 100% with him, um, if you want to find an animal, you need to think like one. And if I was a, a predator walking around here today when it was very hot, I'd be lying out down here in one of these riverine areas where it's very cool. That's just my feeling anyway, and it has often worked very well, so and that's my theory and I'm sticking to it. It seems Steve's got a similar theory. There's a little bit of buffalo dung on the road. Maybe we'll see that one dugger boy that's been waltzing around. Be careful for that buffalo thorn there, VM. What's that coasting through the grass? Looks like a Franklin. Come on, kitty cats. Okay, so those gremlins really have been after Steve today. Um, we continuing our search here through the Mlawati. I'm sure you'll come back soon to us for an update. But uh, off to Steve. Let's see if those gremlins leave him alone. Leave me alone, gremlins. We are trying to move towards the wild dogs in the west. I don't know where I got to in that story earlier, but Herbie said, let's try and come across there. But they do move an enormous distance, and then there never seems to be any sort of plan in their movement. They just sort of go. So let's go across and see if we can help. Oh, hello, little raptor. Looks like a little sparrowhawk flying there, Craig. I don't know if you're going to be able to get him. Uh, it's just in the middle of the tree there. Not a great... You got a little glimpse of him, but he's disappeared. It's either a little sparrowhawk or a shikra. 
but I can't see him anymore. Anyway, we're off to much larger predators. Let's move. On we go. Kudu is trying to hide in the bushes over there, but we're not after Kudu. Wild dogs, priority, you need to move. If you want to catch them, as Brent said, the uh, VW Beetle trying to catch the Ferrari. Herbie seems to think that they moved through some time today. Uh, it's very hard to put a number on that or time on that. And they could move through in minutes. They could have sleep they could be sleeping, but considering it's actually quite cool. This, I mean, the wild dog presence could be impacting on, on Shadulu and all leopard sort of behavior, but I don't think it will really affect where they go. Uh, leopards just go up a tree when they see, when they see um, wild dogs. They go up, and then the wild dogs will lose interest and move off. There's nothing to be gained from the wild dogs standing under the tree, sort of sieging them and waiting days and days. They'll try to steal their food. If there's no food, they'll move off. It's all about energy, you know, they need to move off to eat and they cover such enormous distances that the leopard territories are just small fractions within that. So the number of leopard territories that probably are encompassed within the wild dog territory is it probably all of them. Gremlins, Bre gremlins infiltrating. Let's go back to gremlin himself, Brent Smith. Oh, leopard tracks here yeah, as well. All the tracks here today. I wonder if this is not Kojima around here. Right on the northern boundary. But we are still VW beetling on the wild dog tracks that keep going west. So sometime during the day today, Uh, the chances to say, uh, you know, I, I haven't had a good live wild dog sighting since I've been back. So I'm going to go at even the slimmest chance. And, and they might pop out at Sydney's waterhole. <laughs> Kirsten says they're angry with me because I abandoned them. Yes, that, that must be definitely must be it, Kirsten. No, it's not. There we go. See, so they're chasing each other, running here. You can see the tracks when they on the hard stuff, they're quite a lot more difficult to see. But this is a busy road. Here we go, there's some stuff when they hit the softer stuff. It's been very windy, so you can see the edges are not very sharp. Oh, come on puppies, come on puppies! Now one animal I'm not looking forward to, to bumping into on bushwalk this afternoon is what Ralph has got. Well, I tell you what, Brent, you could definitely bump into this guy. He is fast asleep. I don't even think he's woken up with us being in the area. We're right next to him. When we drove up here, he did not move except for his ear just getting irritated, I think, by the grass and a little bit of the flies. But he's breathing very heavily like he is in deep slumber. He's obviously the one that this uh, that uh, this morning Steve had where they were rolling around in the mud. And not too far down the Mlulwati either. Remember, I did see that buffalo dung just a bit sooner, and that was perfect sign that we were behind a buffalo. Listen to him heavy breathing. He's really enjoying his sleep. Deep slumber there. And he's... Not in such bad nick, so I don't think there's anything wrong with this guy. I think he's just fast asleep. You wouldn't want to walk in on this guy because if he had to wake up in a surprise, and there he's lifting his head a little bit, that he has not a worry in the world. I wonder if he knows that there's a couple of male lions just up the road. Beautiful red bulled ox pecker just landed there, giving us a nice call as well. That is nice. They are very pretty birds, aren't they? And they don't have the most melodious of calls, but a very, very important. 
Uh, I'm not. I'm not so sure that there's anything wrong with this buffalo, everybody. I think he's just having a wonderful sleep. I could be wrong, but uh, I've seen him a few times, and uh, he looks very healthy. Today he was having an absolute jaw. That's what we say in South Africa. He was having an absolute jaw in the pan. He was having a party on his own, rolling around from side to side. Uh, I don't think there's too much wrong with him, but there could be if these lions work out that he's sleeping just downstream from where they are. Well, sleeping lions to sleeping buffalo. It's a sign of the heat today. You might see this oxpecker just going for a bit of food. Gemma, I'm probably within about 20 feet, it's about 10 meters to this buffalo, so we're very close. When we zoom out like that, it's lit, it won't be more than 15 meters, but I'd say about 10. So if I had to climb off the vehicle here, I could very, I could almost go and run and jump on him. That would be a fantastic rodeo, wouldn't it? Try and ride a buffalo. Wow. I think I'd be a hero with all my friends, but uh, I might not live to tell the tale. Mia, it is quite unusual um, that he hasn't moved, but as I say, maybe because of the heat he's, he's, and he's been having so much fun in the pan, maybe he's tired himself out. And so he's just having a very deep sleep. You know, I've come across elephants, rhino, buffalo, um, and, you know, quite a few animals at the odd times when they are literally fast asleep. And uh, it's, it's fascinating because, yeah, at a moment you might wake up and get a total surprise that we're standing here. You know, once in Botswana, um, in uh, Mana Pools, I was walking down the road, well, not a road, down a little um, game path. Um, and because there we used to be able to walk without any ranges or anything like that. And um, I was walking down a game path, going birding and just enjoying the bush. And uh, up in front of me, there was an elephant walking. So I sort of slowed down and just watched. And as he got closer, I realized that he was fast asleep. But he had walked this path probably for, you know, decades. And uh, he was fast asleep walking on the road. And I had to literally clap my hands uh, to make him realize that uh, I was in front of him. And he woke up in a surprise. And, uh, well... Fortunate for me, he just carried on on his way, but it just shows, oh, uh, the oxpecker is just irritating him a bit there. He's cleaning his bill on the, on the horns. Morning, sunshine. Hope we're not disturbing your sleep. Oh, that oxpecker really wants to have a go, but he's disturbing this buffalo's sleep, isn't he? Minamu, um, it's mostly red-billed oxpeckers, but particularly uh, yellow-billed oxpeckers. They are specific to, or almost specific to, buffalo. If you hear a yellow-billed oxpecker, uh, you can pretty much know that uh, he's on or near to uh, some buffalo. But other birds that will be around, uh, uh, yeah, he's going and picking in his eye there. Wow, that would be irritating. Um, you would find uh, drongos, so the fork-tailed drongos. They will also fly around them and sometimes sit on their back because the buffalo bumps up some insects for them. And also cattle egrets. So those are mostly the birds that you'll find around them. The cattle egrets, the uh, drongos and the oxpeckers, and the odd wagtail as well because they're also insectivorous. And so as the buffalo walks through the grass, well, he bumps up all the insects. So you've got the, the birds, the oxpeckers, that actually feed on the buffalo, and then you've got the birds that feed uh, around the buffalo as, it, as it's walking through the bush. <laughs> you see this guy? He's really using this buffalo. He's having a go in his nose and then cleaning his bill off. It's probably because of all the mud. He wants to get rid of the mud on his, on his horn. And you see how experienced the oxpecker is at being on buffalo as well. He knows exactly where to go to clean his bill, straight back to the horn. 
and this can be quite scary if you to come in here um, and not know that this buffalo is there. That's why if you hear oxpeckers when you're walking on a bushwalk, you always need to take note because we often get complacent because red-billed oxpeckers will also be on animals like giraffe, impala, um, kudu, etc. But they can very often be on big animals like buffalo as well. And so we need to listen out when we hear oxpeckers. Um, because in this situation, you would be walking here, not knowing that the buffalo is there, but you'd hear the ox pecker. And if you take note of that, you'll then have an early warning that there's a buffalo sleeping here. See the little signs that we need to know of when we're walking in the bush? Very important. <laughs> Garand, yes, it's... It must be quite irritating, you saying that it's making your own nose itch. Uh, I know, imagine having that ox picker sticking its bull right up your nose. Uh, can see. Oh, he's even starting to ruminate a little bit now, starting to chew the cud. Shame, these ox pickers are really irritating his slumber. And he's got a, probably getting a piece of grass in his ear every time there. Maybe the odd fly. And then flicking it, and he's really not worried about too much. There's a couple of ticks as well. And always the odd tick. Well, I say the odd tick. He's probably got hundreds of ticks, and that's completely normal for them to have lots of ticks, especially under their armpits, behind the back legs, behind the ears, on the ears, all around. And they'll get what they need, and they'll drop off and lay their eggs and start the process all over again doesn't really do too much to a healthy buffalo. It's not really doing much to this guy. He looks fat. And Debra, well, you know, on on a buffalo, it's not, uh, as I say, the, 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 the specialist uh, buffalo ox picker is the yellow build. So these red build ox pickers, they're more adept at um, combing through the hair of um, animals like impala, giraffe, kudu. That's what you mostly find red build ox pickers on. And the ones, the yellow build, they literally pick the ticks off and so much better adapted to um, the buffalo. And you see now, there it's got a little wound uh, and he's getting right in there. That obviously hurt him a little bit. He doesn't like that that ox pick is going into that wound on the side. But it looks like he's going back. Remember, ox pickers are sanguinivores, sanguinivores, or vampire vores, as some of you might say. And he likes to drink blood. So whether he's going to get it from the ticks or from a little wound, He'll go for any of it. So sometimes they can be a slight pest, and they go from a from a mutualistic symbiotic relationship to being actually a detriment to the animal. And they keep those wounds open. And very nice to watch. I'm sure he's going to wake him up again. Mia, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think the ox pickers can irritate um, the buffalo, just like mosquitoes irritate us. But I think that at least the ox pickers have a sort of use uh, in helping to get rid of the the parasites as well. Um, mosquitoes pretty much uh, are to the detriment of us, uh, regardless of of the times when we're with them or anything like that. So there's no bonus for us having uh, mosquitoes except for population control and natural selection. But we, as humans, we sort of sidestep that with modern medicine, don't we? So, and I mean, yeah, I've got kids myself. It wouldn't be just a fact of letting one of my boys die just to uh, keep strong genes. A Ravinda, they're called ox peckers because um, they they obviously go on all the cattle, on all the oxen, they go on the buffalo, and uh, that, that's where they do pick their ticks from. So 
they're not called tick pickers uh, because of the... Well, they could be called that, I suppose. That's not a bad idea to call that. Um, but, yeah, it's mainly to do with the fact that they are found on the cattle and on the oxen and on the buffalo. Um, and that's initially probably many moons ago when they first discovered these birds was probably on the cattle. And so they called them the ox pickers. Very pretty birds, aren't they? And a very distinguishable call. You see all those little midges and flies and things? It's probably because of the mud that's on the buffalo at the moment. He's got a very dreadlocky type hair now. That's so why it's not that great for this ox picker. It's still wet mud. He's probably going to go and rub himself on something when he dries off a bit. That also helps get rid of the parasites. And the buffalo not only enjoys rolling in the mud, it does serve a use. So I wonder if this buffalo is going to wake up. But uh, I'm not going to be waking him up on purpose. I might uh, just slide past him in a minute. Um, but in the meantime, off to Brent. Let's see how the search for wild dogs is going. Well, the dog tracks are no longer on the road here. It looks like they've gone into Juma, but we're in that tiny top corner. So they could have scooted across to the west. And we're going to take this big game path now. There's a pan at the end of it. So hopefully um, we might find something. Now it's always possible that Shadulu might have been chased by the wild dogs because as soon as we found those tracks, her tracks disappeared and so she might have run off from them. But if she does like to sort of come back into this area and then cross into the west somewhere around here, but hopefully she hasn't. Hopefully she's somewhere up ahead. Okay, now let me just try to get to some soft sand. So, Carrie, there's quite a big difference between wild dog and cheetah tracks. Cheetah tracks are actually quite big for a slight animal. Uh, and, of course, it's got that three little lobes that the cats have on the back. Uh, they're big and they're wide. Dog tracks are narrow and thin with normally the two prominent claw marks from the front. Let me just try to get to some soft sand where I can draw more or less. Here we go. Should be able to make do here. Okay. Oh, let's get into position here. So a cheetah track would normally have those three obvious lobes your finger is always easier for and then with the cheetah track you can normally just see the claw sort of away from the toe like that and obviously this is much bigger than a cheetah track would be uh, a dog track is sort of two lobed like that so quite narrow and then with the toes quite close together but there's always that very distinct you can't always see it but you can see the claw Claws are much, much smaller, um, much, much more narrow, much more narrow, um, with those very prominent long uh, claws from the, the two middle toes being being very visible, uh, and that's how you normally see tracks. It's very seldom that we ever see tracks in sort of perfect conditions, slightly damp mud that you can get everything in. So you, you're normally looking at something sort of a bit more like that, but uh, it's very difficult to get confused between dog and cheetah tracks. Far more easily to get confused between dog and hyena tracks. Thought I heard something there for a second. Nope. <laughs> Thank you, Origin. Origin says I'm an artist. I try, Origin, I try. Now, I am hoping... Oh. Some Franklin running away from us. See them there, Dave? I think they're going to disappear. Little crested Franklins. It's the 
time of the day now that if Shidulu has been sleeping somewhere, she might be moving. So it always pays to, even while on foot, stop and listen for a few seconds. Want to hear the bark of a kudu? Now, as it gets further and further into the dry season, we have to be more and more careful of those buffalo bulls like Ralph had, because they will come onto these permanent water areas around here. So we've got to be a lot more careful. And this area in particular is a major thorough through from the Manuleti, where there's very little water in the southern Manuleti. So you get big groups of buffalo, elephant, and uh, what happens when those big herds of buffalo move off, often some of those old, boil, old bulls will stay behind. So I'm just going very carefully checking for tracks on the soft sand. While we continue our search for leopard or wild dog, Let's send you back to Rolf, who's moved on from that buffalo bull. Well, that's all very exciting with Brent, isn't it, everybody? As I just try and negotiate this little stump here next to us. Um, wow, if you can find those wild dogs, that would be fantastic, because uh, it's been a long time since I've seen them. But what we're doing is we're just heading back towards where the lions are, because we've heard that they're up. Well, at least their heads are up, so they're having a look around. So I want to go and look at them. It'll be very interesting because there's a buffalo not far away. And if they knew that, I think they might uh, uh, give that buffalo a little bit of a surprise. But um, it's heading towards that time. That lion's going to be active, so let's head that way and see what happens. Now, Tether, I don't particularly think that oxpecker calls bring lions towards the buffalo. Um, it might alert them to the fact that there are some animals nearby, uh, but I don't think so. It's mainly that noise of the buffalo, um, whether they hear his breathing, whether they smell him, or whether they hear that of the buffalo um, that is kind of noises that they might be listening out for so it's not um, I think the wind would have to blow in their direction from this buffalo uh, up towards these lions for them to realize that there is a buffalo down there um, because otherwise it could as I say be um, and they know this it could be giraffe impala could do more likely with the red billed oxpecker so not taking too much notice when they hear that it's more the smell coming to them. And the direction of the wind needs to be right. But that's why you'll often see predators just picking their head up into the wind, into the breeze and smelling out. Um, so they, they normally pick up first with their smell and then sort of lock in with their, with their sight. And anyway, that's what I've uh, experienced with predators and especially animals like hyena. So let's get nice and close to these lions, see what's happening. I hope that we have some excitement. Um, but uh, let's uh, go over and see the battle with the gremlins and Steve. The gremlins have been defeated with a sword and a screwdriver and a computer and a technician by the name of Jared. Well, we hope they're sorted. We replaced the aerial, we replaced the cable, he did some configuring that's about as much detail as I can tell you because I don't know anymore but um, we defeat it with a screwdriver fantastic so now we are back and uh, we are headed towards the west and I hope not too late for any passing canines that might be moving through the area it'll be marvelous to find some wild dog I've only seen them once here on Juma and they're my first week Casey, you want to know if wild dogs are related to dingoes, and um, they're part of the dog family, so the, the wild dog is most certainly a canine, and uh, the wolf and foxes and jackals are all come from some family lineage, and at some point long ago they would have 
they would have split. But I'm not sure exactly the history of the dingo, but I'm, I'm guessing it's quite similar to that of the jackal. And so there definitely would be some family sort of history there. So, yeah, that's about the extent of, of my knowledge on, on that. I did see a dingo once when I was in Australia. It was not nowhere near as impressive as I thought it would be. And then there'd be lots of stories for years and years and years about dingoes. But then when you're seeing animals the size of what we see here in, in Africa and you go and you see a dingo there, you're like, oh, he's so little. <laughs> and, um, yeah, but still a marvelous animal. Maybe we'll find a jackal as well. Wild dogs, jackal, leopard. Glad Ralph was able to find that buffalo. Um, I'd imagine what those two Birmingham males would do if they came across him. That would be a battle of note. I would quite enjoy seeing. But it seems I'm off on the leopard and wild dog search which Ralph had embarked on initially the leopard search and now he has captivated the audience with his visuals of the lions which I fully understand I didn't think they would be going anywhere anytime soon so I thought I'd go off and find some more animals for you in the meantime namely the elephants and this uh, the stampeding herd of snails that someone requested we weren't going to find them there with the lions but hopefully they get up and do something soon. We're keeping our eyes very well peeled, Crago. Wild dogs could be anywhere. And when they are about, they are moving pretty quickly. There's the tracks. Brent Lyersmith, you wouldn't know if a wolf would survive in Africa. Well, first you'd need a bit of a haircut, I would say. Uh, their shaggy coats are very well adapted to the winter climate, so they'd probably lose, actually. I think they molt their fur and when it gets warmer. I think they would survive if they came in a, in a group, a pack. I don't think um, an individual wolf would do very well. I think they'd do well as a unit. So I think they would fit into a very similar niche to that of the wild dog, but maybe feeding on a prey species that's a bit bigger. Because I think a wolf is bigger than a than a when a a wild dog. I've never compared them in weight. It might just be the, the fur that they're always carrying that makes them look so much bigger. So I think a wolf would do well. It's just they're predators from different continents that have filled the same sort of ecological niche. That's very, very common. Just like a certain antelope versus deer in other countries. Uh, possibly tigers and then lions in Africa. Similar sort of, or leopards, should I say. Well, first we're going to have a little view here of the sky with these beautiful impala doing their thing. And then as soon as you're ready, we're going to go back over to the cats and see what it is they are doing. Well, everyone, this is now from a sleeping buffalo to some sleeping lions. A very sleepy, lazy afternoon, isn't it? But it's always worth our while to come down here next to Vuyatela Dam. And if these lions uh, decide to get up a little bit later, well, we'll be right here. I think we're going to sit with them a little while. Maybe we'll get lucky and they roar. That will be fantastic to get on camera. And, well, we could have any of the other predators coming down for a drink. Um, there's been lots of activity with the leopards around. They'll obviously be very cautious with these lions here if they spot them. Now, origin, I have to say that the origin of, um, <laughs> of white lions or leucistic lions, as they are better known as, um, is um, actually just a genetic variation. 
So it's it's like um, it's not albinism because they do normally have blue eyes, so they do have pigment. Um, it's just a very low in pigment, so it's a very rare genetic variation. They are not created by man; they do occur naturally, and they um, I think naturally in the Timbavati uh, area of Thorny Bush. Uh, type um, area in the Kruger National Park is where we have naturally occurring leucistic uh, lions and there are still some around at the, at the moment. Uh, there's not a lot of them and the the genetics says that uh, there will be, uh, you know, the ratios is probably one in like 20,000 or something like that um, but the variation still exists naturally and it's it's not um, it's not anything produced by man. What we do now is we like that trait because they've got blue eyes and very light fur, almost white. So it makes for very nice f photography and photos. So um, I know, like you know, I managed a game reserve down in the Eastern Cape, which had exactly that. They had introduced a couple of leucistic lions um, because it was. Um, a very photogenic and so drew a lot of tourists who paid a lot of money but it wasn't like they were in camps or anything they were left free on the natural reserve but um, they were brought in for their aesthetic value and photogenic quality but they do occur naturally it's quite similar to that of the king cheetah um, which is also a genetic variation. It's exactly the same species, just slightly different color patterns and also being bred because of that uh, difference there. I just stopped because this guy was snoring. <laughs> and it's also like the melanistic leopard. Now, thank you to the viewers saying that uh, one of these is called Tinio. Which one is it? Is it the one that's upside down or the one that's lying on his side? You can tell me. I haven't really been able to see any real characteristics on them. So it seems it might be the one lying on his side. I think the one on his side is the one that's potentially injured. Oh, Kirsten telling me this one that's rolling around is the one that's injured. Okay. Oh yes, I did see a little bit of a mark by his eye, but I was looking for where he's, he's got injured on his body. Um, but as I was saying, you get those um, melanistic leopards also down in the Eastern Cape. That's where they naturally occur. Um, and that's also um, genetic variation. And it's a very gnarled, battle axe type looking male lion this is. Okay, so you guys are saying that this is Tinio, huh? Good. Good. I hope that they get up soon and give us a show. And in Schluckel. Okay. Well, that's good. So we've got the names here. Well done, everyone. Thanks for your input. That's what it's all about. You see, they've got the start of black manes as well. Uh, there's every possibility they're becoming a little bit more active. Let's hope that they start yawning soon and stretching. There's every chance that they might. But this is the time of day you want to be around lions because they could be waking up soon, roaring, marking, spraying, scratching, drinking, doing all of that. We can only hope at the moment they're just like twins with their legs like that. Kathy, with the Birminghams being back, well, those evokers are going to have to be careful, aren't they? Because I'm putting all my money on these battle-hardened males, um, chasing those evokers for cover as soon as they realize what's going on and that the evokers have been pushing in here because they're still budding youngsters and uh, not battle-hardened like these guys are. So my money's on them 100%. I think uh, you wouldn't get too much money from the bookies if you bet on the Birminghams against the Evokers, I would say, because uh, if you know anything about these guys, you would say that they, um, they're going to send those Evokers packing. 
but it will be interesting. I mean, we can think that, but you never know. You never know. The wildlife has a way of surprising you. Who knows? Maybe those youngsters are just in the right time, the right form of their life. I just have my doubts. I think these guys are way too strong and battle-hardened for them. Right. I'm not going anywhere. We're going to stay here and see if this does get a little bit more exciting. Um, but in the meantime, off to Brent and let's see how his uh, wild dog search is still going. If he is still searching. I'm always searching for wild dogs, but we have an impala. We can't find any tracks of the wild dogs crossing out of Juma. So they could be around here somewhere. They might have caught a big male impala in one of these blocks and gone to sleep. And uh, the impala is so distracted, we're about to have a little argument here. And they're going to run, just go down, Dave. They might run straight into us. So say they're so distracted with each other at the moment, they don't even notice us standing right next to them. <laughs> Running back to try to keep the girls in one place. He's done badly. Last time I was here, he had about 40. He's down to five. But no sign of the dogs just yet. Or the or Shadulu. I think Shadulu's gone north there. And so we're just carefully checking down where to the axis. We actually uh, are sort of hitting an opening because as it gets darker now with the clouds tonight, we're going to start slowly making our way back towards camp. Uh, probably still a couple of k's away. It is beautiful out here this evening. Definite wintry feel to. To, to everything at the moment. The ground's getting dustier. The colour of the grass is changing. And I, I'm a big fan of the dry season. I really do love it. Tracking is also a lot easier. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I've always enjoyed the dry season, even since I was a little boy. Especially up in northern Botswana, those massive herds of buffalo and elephant coming down onto the rivers. <laughs> Excitement. Lots of fun. Well, so Shadulu often does this loop. I didn't hear that. Did you hear that, Dad? Sorry, cursed. Broke up there for a second. Oh, Hobie, have you got a track? No. <laughs> Stop to double check. No track. Okay, well, as I said, those dogs could really just pop out anywhere around here at the moment. There's no tracks of them leaving. But uh, hopefully they pop out in front of us. We, as it gets darker, we're going to start heading home and uh, send you across to Steve to see what his plans are. Well, no updates from the dogs. The tracks, I haven't found any yet. We're doing a bit of a, a scan around. So we will we'll keep trying. Keep trying. It is a nice sort of temperature. Good sort of running around hunting in parlor kind of weather. Timothy, that is a very good question. I do not have the answer, but they roam much further than all the other animals. They just keep going and going and going and going. They have stamina to, to compete with no one. No one can compete with the wild dog and their stamina. Maybe hyena can, but hyena run during the night and they cover enormous distance sort of on their own and then they call themselves together but wild dogs strategy is to chase animals down and to run them into the ground until they fall down and they basically get eaten alive so and they can cover enormous distances I couldn't tell you the exact distance because I honestly don't know the answer to that um, but they could go from probably the northern side of Kruger of Sabi Sands to the southern side in one morning no problem no problem. I remember my time at Singita down. I spent some time in the Sabi San Singita, and the wild dogs would come in, they'd call the tracks, and within five minutes they were out the other side. And by no means is that a small property. The dogs just don't have the same boundaries we have. They just move. And they move in relation to food and their den site, obviously. But they can roam at quite vast distances. Okay, well, there we have got a leopard track coming in fantastic 
Who is this? We're sort of back in the in the west, but in the northern side, around where Brent's looking for Shadulu. We have tried to find tracks of the dogs crossing, but there's been no luck there. So maybe they will, as Brent says, just pop out. But let's just keep going. Go back down here again. Have another little squiz at the distance of these tracks. Get off the vehicle to have a look. Well, while I make a little bit of a head or tail of all this, let's go to Ralph with the two Birminghams. Yes, everyone, and I've just been looking at my little bit of paperwork while uh, VM shows you some close-ups of the anatomy of, uh, I think that was, Nsuku, the one lying on that side, and the other one being Tinyo. So Nsuku means gold, and Tinyo means tooth. So the two that we have here, was it, I think it was Tinyo and Nsuku that you guys said, yes. I'm still working out how to identify them, but uh, the Birmingham boys consist of four males. So the two that are missing, that are not here at the moment, is Nena, which means warrior, and Mfumo which means authority. So there's two, those two not here. But um, Birmingham boys, uh, they called such because they were born in 2013 on the farm Birmingham in the Timbavati. So that's quite a way from here. So they've traveled quite a long distance to obviously come through here and dominate the Styx and Unkohuma prides. Now I wonder with their travels down south from here, where and who they have been dominating. Must be other females there. I'm sure Brent knows, but um, I'm still catching up with all the information. And so we're still sitting, waiting, hoping for them to roar and give us a show. But in the meantime, off to the bushwalk team. Something exciting over there. Right. We've got something that is very elusive. They don't like being seen. They're trying to hide behind a hat. We've got Alicia and Geraldine who've been uh, jogging outside the reserve. Jerry, Jerry's bad driving. She nearly ran into me. Ran into no, me. Jerry definitely nearly ran into me. Uh, did you have a good run, Geraldine? It was very productive. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It looked like you might have taken some apple juice and sat on the road rather than actually gone for a run. You just put exercise clothes on. Well, David, she nearly drove over you there. Have you found a no, they're all gone to the north. Wow. And they're wild dog tracks all around here. That's what we've been looking for. Leisha! Why? Why must you do this? Why must you because people... Look at her, look how sweet Okay, guys. Um, you may pass. Stall. Don't stall, Jerry. Don't stall. I know. Look at that, they pretend, see that's what they do, they pretend to go do a a exercise, but they actually just go watch the sunset and drink apple juice. Naughty, naughty, naughty little cretins those two. Sorry, it's not apple juice, Kirsten is correct, they drink grape juice. Generally from a white grape, those two. Okay. We still haven't had any tracks of those dogs coming out. There's a male leopard truck that's been driven over by everyone um, heading out into the west. Uh, probably Hukumuri. Uh, probably Hukumuri going out that way. But it's been driven over a lot and I think it was from early last night. I actually heard, uh, just before I went to bed last night, I heard a male leopard sawing up in this area at around 10 o'clock. So. Probably the hook. He's probably all the way back down in the west somewhere again, but he'll be back. Now, I'm still just sort of hoping for those wild dogs to just jump out of the bush next to us. Now, wild dogs have a lot of different um, vocalizations. They do have a bark, Minamu, that is similar to a domestic dog, but they don't bark incessantly. So that bark is a is a is an alarm call. So if they spot a lion or something like that, they give a. Burr. And so it's more of a cough than a bark, I suppose, like a. Burr. 
and that's when they they've spotted a predator. Um, when they lose each other, they have contact calls. They're called woo calls. Woo, 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 woo. Um, and that's how they try to locate each other. They've got lots of little chitters and squeaks when they're excited or when they're greeting or when they're regurgitating. So they've got quite an extensive vocal, vocal range. Not one of which we've heard today. <laughs> oh my goodness, I've got a feeling the dogs have to make an appearance before I go and leave, which is coming close. So fingers crossed. Maybe tomorrow morning is my dog, dog morning. Okay. Uh, no, it's a hyena. Um, let's go across to Steve to see how his tracking's going. Yes, well, not sure where that female has gone with her track. She was going back south, sort of towards our area. Um, we just come to make another little look at that impala carcass that Wildebeest and I found this morning. Just have a look if maybe someone materializes here after dark as it's starting to get a bit darker. Carcass does look to be hanging a bit more than this morning. But I suppose that's what happens to meat when you leave it out to dry. It stretches and hangs. Okay, so you, Ralph has been here already. They've checked it. But, you know, it always pays to, because Gajima is apparently quite a skittish sort of leopard. And I remember many times in the past, leopards outside of Sabre Sands, that you find them or you find a kill in the morning. And then as it gets darker, you come back and there they are. In the morning, they ran away. In the afternoon, much more relaxed. It's kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to this time of sort of day. But um, that is going to be it. We're going to go back and check the west, see if we can get inside of those dogs and possibly... Oh! Lady Starfire, wild dogs would go over, go after whatever animal picks their fancy and shows themselves in front. So definitely this time of year is a plethora of male in parlor, not just for the leopards and the lions, but also for the wild dogs. So they pick whatever they can get. And um, a, a, the male and parlor, and I was looking at one earlier, after we left those lions, one male and parlor was kind of sitting down and still doing his rutting calls. You could really see the bones on his hips starting to show, because he probably hasn't had a proper meal in about a week. And he's just running, 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 chasing, gurgling, trying to mate. And uh, he's probably not going to make the season. He might have started a bit too soon. When it's better to, and wild dogs will pick out those individuals, the weak ones, the one who's maybe limping a bit, looking a bit skinny, maybe having a bit of a wobble, those sort of things. So most certainly. And as soon as the Impala see them, they will all just head for the hills. Okay, well, let's go back to Ralph and see if the Birmingham boys are going to do anything about their meal this evening. Well, all they've done for now is breathe and roll a little bit. Oh, oh, there's a bit of movement. Hello. Come on, give us a stretch. A wonderful black mane, that. Very much like the Kalahari black-maned lions that we find in the desert. A very distinctive sort of genetic line that as well. Those completely black manes. This is just getting a little bit dark around the bottom, but the Kalahari maned lines, it's it's completely black. And I think it has a lot to do with the area that they're in in that desert type conditions, absorbing a lot of the 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 light, I would say, because you have a lot of reflection of the rocks and so on. And so I think it's, you know, dual purpose. Not only does it um, make them look mean and nasty, but it also, I'm sure, has has an effect with the with the heat and the light uh, um, in in the sort of arid regions, because that's where you find the black maned lions.
Minamu, it's, it's generally the males that have the, well, uh, it's, it's always the males that have the mane because mostly to protect them uh, when they're fighting between each other. So the male lions, they are sort of through evolution designed to fight um, with other males and, and also obviously with that um, in mind, they need to look big and, um, and authoritative and also to protect their neck area. So that's what it's all about. Males are designed for fighting, females designed for hunting and stealth. So they are real hunting machines, whereas males are real fighting machines. And uh, it's not to say that males can't hunt. They're just not as, um, as good at concealing themselves and getting up close to, to animals uh, without them knowing. But once the females have potentially grabbed a big prey, like a hippo or even going as far as uh, elephant or or giraffe or buffalo and the male gets in the mix well it just makes that job so much easier because he can bring it down virtually on his own uh, I saw a, a male lion bring down a giraffe over a ton in, um, in Itosha National Park in, in Namibia now as the sun starts setting and we wait for these lions to get up and give us a show, uh, let's head on over to Steve with that beautiful sunset. Absolutely gorgeous afternoon. I mean, are there any words to describe the beautiful red glow of the setting orb of the sun? Enormous cloud builder on the escarpment gives that beautiful red color. It's rain on the horizon. Very special time of day. We are privileged enough to just get to spend some time every afternoon. I wonder how many people out there physically try and watch the sunrise and set every day. It's quite a spiritual practice. Jennifer, I agree, absolutely gorgeous. Everything we know, all existence on this planet is due to that ball of fire in the sky. The best time of day to look at it now, because you can actually look through the atmosphere, and that's why it's got that red. The whole of Johannesburg in the high felt is between us and the sun at the moment, and that's why that atmosphere with the dust pollution and all that sort of stuff gives it that beautiful, beautiful red glow. Just another moment with that before we move off. Commenting how big it looks today. It looks enormous. We are right up on the Bufusuk, right up on the Bufusuk boundary. And I'm going to just keep quiet for a moment. There's my moment. Beautiful. I love to spend moments just quietly looking at the sun. What is there to say, really, about a sunrise and a sunset, apart from it being absolutely beautiful? Well done, Eloise. Well done. I'm very proud of you. I must admit that when I'm on leave, I struggle to watch every sunrise and sunset, catching up on some sleep. But it is something that I think everybody should try and do every now and again, just spend some time with the creation of, of life on Earth, really the sun, all the photosynthetic potential it puts forward and everything that's green and the life around us and all the interactions we see all by the sun's energy which we, if we could harness, we would solve all of our problems on the planet we just get a few days of energy off that sunshine and it would 
solve everything. One last look as it slowly goes behind the Drakensberg Mountains. Steve is complimenting Craig and his camera work. Thanks, Craig. So between us and where the sun is setting, sort of the Drakensberg Mountain there, everything within that and north and south to a degree is falling in the biosphere reserve called the Blader or the Kruger to Canyon Biosphere Reserve, which encompasses farms, communities, wilderness, wildlife, conservation areas, private land, homesteads. And it's obviously aiming to create corridors for for conservation, for, for humans living within the landscape. There's many, many organizations involved with these try and make as much land available to fall under a conservation banner as possible. Slightly different to the Transmontier reserves, which are basically nature reserves or game reserves across borders. The Biosphere Reserve, because we've realized that people are living in the landscape across the world. We need to be able to mitigate the damage they do, and control them in some way and bring them into a broader sort of picture of conservation as a whole and um, that's what these biospheres or reserves are doing and there's a number of them in South Africa I wouldn't know too many elsewhere in the world but very very good initiative on we go into the setting Sun and while we move off let's go over to Brent and see what his thoughts are I've no doubt he watched the sunset himself Well, we weren't the only ones watching the sunset. The giraffe have been watching us walk down the road. We're pretty close to home now. As you can see, it's getting quite dark already. So, <laughs> and Shaitan will leave the giraffe to keep watching us as we wander further down. Now, as we wander home, I have got a quiz for you. Ha-ha! A quiz. It is a good one, I think. What African country this month had rhino reintroduced since the 70s. What African country just had black rhino reintroduced and black rhino now roam wild and free in this country for the first time since the early 70s when the population was wiped out by poaching. And if you can tell me which national park there and I'll be even more impressed. So which African country for the first time since the early 70s has got black rhino in which national park is it in? Hashtag Safari Life, if you know the answer. It's very exciting. It's uh, very, very, very much up there on my wish list of the, of African countries uh, or and parks to visit. Uh, no, Kirsten. Oh, there's a prize, Kirsten. It's a noddy badge, Kirsten. And you win it for being irritating. <laughs> Very sarky in the air today. <laughs> Sid, very good guess. But Rwanda, if I remember correctly, got their black rhino last year already. Um, so, yes, it was another country. Akagera National Park in Rwanda. Um, got black rhino last year for the first time since the 70s. Yeah, Swaziland, I think there's been black rhino in Swaziland um, for quite some time. And white rhino as well. Um, being so close to South Africa, there's... They're quite easy to move them. Now, this was a, a monumental task and uh, a huge. <laughs> Tristan! Tristan! What are you doing? Aren't you supposed to be on Game Drive on the Mark Tristan Dix? Uh, Tristan Dix is correct. It's Zakuma in Chad. And. Uh... Oh, he's doing a report on the show. Oh, good. Well, good, Tristan. I hope you learned something new today. Um, but yes, yeah, so a massive undertaking by uh, the government of Chad, the government of South Africa, uh, uh, it's at, uh, National Parks of South Africa who donated the rhino, and uh, of course African parks who are running as uh, Zakuma and have helped the elephants come back from near near decimation. So the the park's elephant population dropped from four and a half. There was about four and a half thousand in the 80s, down to less than 400 10 years ago. And that elephant population is now steadily climbing, and they've reintroduced black rhino. So a really, really great success story 
and African Parks is, is doing an incredible job working with African governments throughout Africa to try to reinstate some of these magnificent game areas. So, well done, Tristan. Although I would have expected you to know that, Tristan. Tristan says it's raining and? Like and he'd like a prize. Tristan? Tristan, the prize you get is a whack on the head with my stick when I see you next. That's your prize. Okay, oh yeah, guys, so as you can see, we've reached camp. It's getting a bit dark, and those male lions are very close to where we are. They're a couple of hundred meters down there. So we're going to make sure we're safe from male lions. Because during the day, they don't really pose a threat to us. But from this time of the evening into the darkness, we become part of the food chain. So let's go see if they've decided to do more than just breathe. Now, they're still just breathing, um, but Brent is absolutely correct when he says that um, you don't want to be part of the food chain because lions during the day, I, I wouldn't even have a problem uh, walking near to lions um, during the day, but at night they're a completely different beast altogether. And so it's, you need to be very cautious and, um, and not stay out after dark. And that goes for hyenas, lions, uh, it's, it's almost like, as the saying goes, they grow another leg. And it's quite strange because at the moment we're hearing a lot of alarm calls. Now, whether or not it's just that these animals in the area have just realized that there's lions here, or if there's leopard around, or if there's potentially another two lions making their way down. So there has been quite a bit of calls, um, and especially from the wildebeest, which are just opposite us on the bank where we can't see them but we can hear them. They have been grazing there the whole afternoon though. It would be rather silly of them if they haven't realized that these lions are here now. But the trouble is is that sometimes one animal alarm calls and then the rest of them just alarm call because one of them did. So it's that classic case of uh, a Lilo mimetic behavior, copycat behavior. Somebody does something we all just follow him. We don't really know why. It's almost like sheep, but uh, this Impala looks like he might be wanting to come down for a drink. I'm sure he'll also get a bit nervous if he sees these lions next to the pan. Jamie, um, I haven't heard any news of the Unkahumas. Um, Brent is a good one to ask for that. I'll ask him a little bit later. He's got his, his uh, informers all around here. I don't really know too many people in this area. I do try and get information from some of my ex-students that um, work on some of the lodges around here and that uh, I trained some of them or did part of their training with them. Um, but uh, I haven't heard anything of the Unkahumas recently. And, but this is fantastic news that the Birminghams are back here. And that's Juma Lodge in the background that you just saw. And these two still fast asleep. Not a worry in the world. Even when all the animals were alarm calling, you know, you very often have, um, when the leopards are around and the animals start alarm calling, they very often run away and get away from the the animals giving away their position. But lions, they don't care. They just carry on snoozing. Wonderful to see, though. And that is the ideal or the utmost best way to chill. They are chilling hard. You can't chill any harder than that. That is very relaxed. Michael, it all depends on what they eat um, in terms of how much they must eat a week. So if they get something nice and big like that uh, dugger boy, the buffalo just downstream from where we are, um, that could set them up for a good part of two weeks. Um, also depending on how many mouths they feed. So it, uh, it all depends on how much they eat, but um, a small feed, like uh, eating a warthog, they could eat every day. 
but something nice and big like a buffalo that could last them up to two weeks so and then you've obviously got all the ratios of the different animals in a bit in between if they get a kudu or if they get a zebra obviously that's going to give them quite a nice uh, lengthy period i had uh, one pride of lions in itosha national park on a zeb uh, on a giraffe pardon me um and they stayed there for for two weeks um in the end it was not very nice near to where they were eating it uh, really stank um but well the protein was still all right for them and they just kept feeding on it so yeah, eventually it is, I think uh, they can also leave it if they're not finishing it because it can be start be getting really, uh, you know, past its sell-by date. It's, it's you know, probably only good for vultures and hyenas with their very acidic stomach. But uh, lions can handle um, relatively decomposed meat as well. Probably makes it easier to digest, I would imagine. But... Uh, <laughs> don't often see them worrying too much about the, the age of the meat and how old it is and how much it stinks. They still get stuck in. But, uh, yes, they are sleeping for now. I still just hope that the show is imminent. And while we wait, off to Steve and see if he's got anything imminent. Eminent, no, that's quite a big word. Eminent, no, we don't have anything eminent. Uh, we've passed some impala that looks all pretty relaxed. If wild dogs had passed, they didn't tell us, so they didn't show that behavior. So we are right on the west now, hopefully. We're thinking, you know, we might just bump into Shadulu or maybe Hukumuri, or maybe some, the other two Birmingham boys, wherever they might be. Wow, Lillian, that's a nice question. The biggest fright I've ever had in the wild. I've told this story before, a few times. My second day in the bush, I decided to get out the car and see if there was a leopard nearby. Because apparently there was a leopard in a kill, it with a kill up a tree and I parked my car. And I was very new, I was very green behind the ears, you would say. And I stepped out of the car to try and find out where this leopard was that wasn't in the tree anymore. And he was in the drainage line just below me. And he decided to come out with the teeth and claws bed roaring a bellow that scared the living daylights out of me. But that's not what frightened me the most. The thing that frightened me the most was when I told my mom her reaction. <laughs> I'm only joking. Her reaction wasn't very bad, but I haven't seen her that upset with me in a long time. <laughs> yeah, so leopards, if they do charge, it is it is a frightening experience. So lesson number one, if a leopard has got a kill, uh, give it space. Don't go walking in there. Don't go walking in there. They make an enormous amount of noise and it just chills you to your to your core. Absolutely. That was a long time ago. There's been other sorts of frights and stuff, but we seem to manage and deal with them quite well. I think, you know, not being afraid out here, but not, you know, managing your fear. It's good to be, have a fear. If you don't have a fear out here, then you become too much of a cowboy and then you're going to get yourself hurt. So it's fine to have fear, but don't let the fear control you and make you just change your decisions. Just still walk with a sense of, of curiosity and awareness and be aware that uh, wild animals are wild animals and anything can happen and don't ever forget that. That is the key. But we are in their space after all. We're just visitors. So it's important to respect them. And um, if there are any warning charges or warning marks or warning signs or whatever it might be, respect those. Don't think you're above that. And I think that's very important. As soon as you lose respect for the animal, you are going to get yourself or somebody quite badly injured. It's my opinion. So, we... Blake, I believe nature is the biggest healer we have out here or anywhere. Uh, just spending some time in 
in the wilderness can do wonders for anybody. Um, first of all, just the clean, fresh air, for one, is enormously beneficial to, to anybody. Um, and then also the sounds in Africa. I've, I've had many, many students, many guests, many people that have visited once and they're hooked. In like two, three years, they come back five or six times. They just can't get enough of this place. You know, if you come from a very busy country, very built up place like Germany, for example, where things are very busy, coming out here will completely turn whatever belief system you have on its head. And, uh, the healing power out here it's not just what it can do for for your energy or for your breathing but that's the de-stressing you come out here and you forget about your iPad and you forget about all the technologies and the emails that you need to check we do need to check our phones quite regularly to keep up to date with certain things but it's amazing when you turn those things off how quickly you just fall back into the rhythm of nature and nature is an enormously powerful element. I mean, we were all born in nature a long, long time ago, and we decided to crowd ourselves into enormous cities where we block out the sounds, smells, and everything. The sense of community even in cities is disappearing. You know, I come from Johannesburg where the walls just get taller and the electric fences more electric, you know, and everybody drives to work on their, in their own car. Traffic is horrendous. There's no sense of community, um, and that's what's lacking a lot in the world and in cities. It's everyone's out to get everybody, and out in nature you realize that animals are very peaceful, and they're just here to be, you know, just here to be. I think when you understand that, you look at human nature very differently. So I love being out here. Love it. I haven't met a single person who's left a trip in Africa and gone, ah, oh, that was pretty average not going to go back there they come back the bug bites the African bug bites and once it does once it bites it you know I'm not talking about tick bites or mosquitoes because malaria can be recurring but once the African bite bug bites you you come back again and again I've got quite a few old guests that just come all the time I think they if I wasn't working in the bush they would definitely be going to the bush more than I do because um, it's just quite profound. You don't have to see anything. You don't have to, like right now, we haven't seen anything in some time, but the fresh air, the smells, the silence. Like, do you hear the, the cars revving past us there, or the airplanes, or the factory generators? No, you don't hear them. Even if Kirst put the ambient right up, you wouldn't hear them. So we are in a very nice wilderness area. It's magical to just be out here. It's a sense of place, you could say. And there are so many different areas in the wilderness. You don't have to be in a wild life area like the Kruger Park. Just a forest or a park, anywhere green with open space can be really, really good for the soul. Okay, so something that really invigorates my soul is when lions call so let's go over to Ralph and see if his cats are anywhere near doing something like that okay everybody um, sorry we are bundu bashing a little bit because we've got monkeys that are going nuts just near to us but um, I've decided we just came just directly towards the monk where the monkeys were calling uh, but it's getting a little bit thick here so we're not going to continue just bundu bashing there both for the uh, sake of the vegetation and for the vehicle um, so we're going to have to head back and try and hit the road I'm pretty sure it's a leopard uh, it's either that or another um, couple of these lines maybe the other two um, that are missing so we're just going to drive over a little bit of these uh, fallen logs here um, and I'm going to go back to the road back past those lions and just go over this dead branch um, and then back up there just listen for a second I'm pretty sure it's a leopard that is very close here. 
so we're right near to this but unfortunately the bush is too thick for us to get through here and it's right next to the lodge i'm pretty sure it might be at that galago pan so we're going to try and loop around and just try and catch up and see if we can get there they're still going crazy and that is definitely a predator Let's just see, I'll just get out of that thick stuff and we'll go out of low range and we can speed up a little bit. I just need to, I don't want to really bunda bash through here. I think the safest bet is just to go back to the road and drive around. So we'll do that. Very exciting this, if we can get towards where these um, monkeys are calling, which uh, will be quite easy. I'm pretty sure it's just there at Galago Pan, but we need to move pretty fast. I don't want to drive just fast just yet. Once, once we get on a nice clean road, then I'll speed up, try and get us there a bit faster. But I can fall into a couple of holes here, so I'm just trying to, as I say, save the vehicle because uh, Steve will tell you how quickly you fall, you fall in a hole. He did that the other night into an art fork hole. And here in the riverbed, there are lots of holes as well. Gina, thanks for your question. Um, these cats can regularly land up in our campsite. Um, so uh, we need to be very careful. There might be a gap through here that we can go up. Let's just have a quick look. Looks quite clear. So Gina, yes, um, we need to close our gates. We actually need to close the kitchen doors and put the dustbin away every night because we have uh, every chance of leopard, lion, and particularly hyena who come for the dustbins um, walking through our camp. Um, so the, the, the hyenas are probably the most common um, second um, uh, being leopard, I think last night there was a leopard that walked right past uh, the camp. It didn't come inside the gate, uh, but it walked right past. And then we had, uh, we often have lions walking past as well. And there can also be elephants which come into the camp as well. Uh, mostly when the marulas are around. Um, so at the moment uh, there's nothing really to attract the elephants in, except for if we had a lot of citrus fruit. Uh, that they could come looking for uh, because you know that elephants love oranges and lemons and nachis or clementines as you would call them I think they are nectarines plums and anything that's fruity and tastes sweet elephants love that okay so we do need to be careful Gina to be very careful we, we, we actually have the rule around camp you have to walk with a bright torch um, because you know it's like that case if you just try it at night shine a bright torch into somebody's eyes you can't see what's behind that torch and so the animals are quite nervous when you shine a bright torch in their eyes the only animal that you don't do that to is an elephant because they really don't like you shining torches in their eyes and they come to get rid of it and swat it away so you don't shine in elephants' eyes, but any of the predators, shine in their eyes and back away. That's the rule. Back away and get into the closest room if you come across a predator. It's quite interesting because uh, my little boy, uh, my firstborn, he was... Uh, there's those monkeys calling again now. He also grew up uh, in the game reserve and he had many of these... Let me grab my spotlight. So I don't, I, I'm also just trying to be careful of the rooms there, everybody, because this, wherever this leopard is, is just behind the rooms. So I don't want to invade people's privacy, but we do want to see if there's a leopard here. And these monkeys are barking that there must be something there. I think I'm going to back up just a little bit and see through that other gap. These monkeys are still calling. It's a little bit before Galago Pan, but we're in the right area now, and we're on a road. Okay, everyone, while I try and see where this cat is, let's try and get in a little bit closer. Um, but let's head you on over to Steve, who I think has got his night vision out now, like us as well. 
We do have our night vision. We are in the infrared spectrum. Sorry if I've lined you with my spotlight there. We are looking as always for something and if Ralph has moved off from the Birmingham boys, well then I think, Kirsty, if you're okay, we're going to sneak back in there and maybe get them roaring before the end of the show. Before the end of the show, we're not far away, but we never want to go too fast. You never know what you might see along the way. We just had a very brief glimpse of a pearl-spotted owlet that we tried to frame up, but they're crepuscular. That's past their, do past their sleepy time. So he slept off, he slunk off, flew off. I think it was a pearl spotted. It could have been a bard. Didn't get a proper look. Now oh, very similar. Easily confused for the size. They're only a few minutes away from Anthony AJ, do you want to know about our speed bumps? These are actually called bolsters. Bolster, and there is the drainage channel. The objective of this bolster is for the water that comes down the road, it goes off the road. The object is to not to slow down the cars, is to get the water off the road. That is the objective, and I know it looks and feels like speed bumps, and sometimes the cameraman at the back give me a hard time because I give them a hard time with the bumps. But it is primarily to get the water off the road. We've created roads, which means water would want to run down the easiest channel. And by doing that causes erosion. So if you don't have a bump, see another one here, and we should have these drainage lines cleared off the side so that the water goes off. And that prevents the, the water from washing away the road, which is the primary objective of it. Because obviously in nature, you wouldn't naturally get roads like this just through the middle of nowhere. There'd always be some form of, of vegetation in the way, unless it was a game path, but then still animals seem to sort of meander along game paths. There's another one, nice big drainage off the side, you can see here, just to get all the water off. Every half a meter change in the gradient, you need to have a bump. Okay, well, let's see if Ralph's managed to find anything from the monkey alarm calls. And I go left here. Hello, everybody. Yes, we're just um, we now we've spot. Oopsie, watch out. There's a bump there. Okay, we're going down this way. We're now following up on where we've spotted the monkey in the tree, and we're looking at the direction that he's looking. He's still calling, um, but he's definitely looking towards the, the Galago pan. So that's where we're headed. Now, all very exciting. And there's a little bush baby calling as well. A very high pitched. Meow. So let's go up here around the corner. That monkey is right up on the top of the tree looking here towards this pan. So let's hope, ooh, and directly in front of us we've also got a wall of rain. It is happening tonight, isn't it? I, saw, I had a feeling today when I was running and it was extremely hot. It had that type of thunderstorm feel to it today. And it looks like it might be coming true. Lots of rain up ahead there. So yes, we're just coming around here. We're going to be coming up towards Galago Pan in a second. Let's have that last minute leopard. Come on. I'm hoping so too. Where are you and what are you? What is your name? Where are you? I don't see anything here. Let's just sit tight for a little while. Kristen, the reason why bush babies are called as such, their Latin name being Galago, um, but uh, the reason why they're called bush babies is because of the thick-tailed bush baby, which is probably the most common, and they go like a real baby. That's the noise that they make, like a crying baby. Ah, 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 ah. That's the noise that a bush baby makes. So th that's the thick-tailed, the little um, lesser bush babies. They make, which was jumping around there now, very high-pitched squeals and little beep, 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 beep. 
and they can also do a bit of a beep, beep, beep. That's all he was doing there in the thickets there. But they can jump up to five meters, which is incredible. Yeah, a little bit like car alarms, says Kirsten in FC. Absolutely. And now it's got very dark, so that monkey has now maybe lost visual on whatever was walking here, and we're not seeing it. What a shame. I'm hoping that if we stay here a little bit longer, we might spot it. But maybe it's still down in that trainee's line. I tell you, it's, it's really sometimes just the luck of the draw, hey? just need to be at the right place at the right time. We know that there's a predator here now. That monkey isn't lying. He's really concerned because there's a spotted cat walking around here. He's told us so. But exactly where is the problem? Okay, fantastic. It seems like I'm playing tag team with Steve. He's back at Voyotella Dam. We'll carry on searching for the spotted cat, but he's with the lions. Mm, thank you, Ralph. These lions have done almost nothing since we left. I think all they've done is gotten a little bit closer to each other. And what we didn't notice earlier was that the one on the left is far not, well, nowhere near as full as the one on the right. Which is awesome. There must have been some squabble. Nsuku and Tino, and Nsuku is the one that's fuller. That one there, I remember seeing him earlier, and Tino is the one that did not get the Impala, I suppose. And it's possible that something was killed and they didn't share. That often happens if one individual is the one making the kill and it's small enough to defend, then it will go un uncontested. And you see it quite often with lions when they feed. I think, Craig, you were with me when we followed the Unkuhumas off that night, eh? Yeah. You can even get a youngster that might grab a piece and move off and anyone that tries to approach there will be growls and snarls and it's kind of like a just like an unspoken rule the others will just leave they won't they won't try and steal that little morsel or bone or leg or fillet or head or whatever it is that has been stolen I kind of respect the toy those of you who were with me right in the beginning in January when we had the Unkuhumas with those tortoises they weren't giving them up. It's only when the one didn't, well, look the other way. They were stolen. Tom, I don't think there's really a leader in the pride. They, they, they it, Invariably, coalitions are brothers. Uh, if they're not brothers, then they similar age lions that have come together to form a coalition for the benefit of themselves. And there's no real leader. Just like I'm talking about food, what you'll see when it comes to mating, the first male to sort of spot or smell an estrus female, he kind of, he's in charge of that female. There won't be any competition for her. I'm not saying the males won't follow him for days while he mates with that female, but invariably the first one to come across the female is sort of the one who will cover her. But um, there's no real leader. Um, you might get different personalities in the pride, you might get different individuals that might instigate the fight or go in and attack another male before the others do or whatever it might be they might lead forward but I've never really noticed a leader per se in a coalition of, of male lines. Um, it's possible there is something like that but it's nothing I've ever personally witnessed before. Uh, it just seems to be the one that gets there first seems to be in charge of the day's play and because they are assisting each other they sort of there's like a gentleman's agreement between them they don't want to fight physically they do have scraps and and little punch-ups but it's nothing nearly as serious as proper proper fighting yes well there's Ravinda there's always some form of sort of what we think to be real aggression but what it is being just being a lion you know I mean if you see a pride feeding there's an enormous aggression showed between members while they're feeding, but they love each other. As soon as the meat is gone and the bloodlust is out of the nose, they go and lick each other and apologize for the, the noise they made. And But that is part and parcel of being a lion. Um, if they didn't do it, they wouldn't get to the sort of stage that they're at, the evolutionary stage that lions are at. They would be a weak species. 
So that competition, which is ingrained from, as I mentioned, I think in the school drive, from the suckling stage all the way up to dominance and male coalitions is all very important from a sort of genetic point of view and moving forward. If there wasn't any fighting, there wouldn't be scraps, the lines wouldn't be as strong as they are, they wouldn't be able to fight as well as they do. And obviously, because these guys are a coalition, they need to keep their bonds together. When we first saw them, uh, when Tino came and joined the other young gentlemen, there was a bit of face rubbing, a very quick little face rub, but they often, as you can see, sleep really close to each other. They take comfort in each other's presence because as two, they are stronger than one, and as three, they are stronger than two. So they know that. They don't want to sort of get rid of the third musketeer, so to speak. So it's important for them to keep their bonds strong. And yes, the fighting that we see, we might think is unbelievable, but in lion terms, it's really just part and parcel of, of being a lion. Well, in, all, in all honesty. Okay, well, it looks like Ralph is searching in all the nooks and crannies for a leopard. Let's see how he's doing. Well, everyone, I'm coming to where, you know what, you'll never believe me, but last night, uh, after I had spent pretty much uh, the entire last part of the drive uh, looking for leopard, not finding anything, um, I think we had the odd scrub here, and we were talking about all sorts of things and the lack of uh, animals to see, and um, we literally went off air, the show finished, and Hosanna was here. So, yes, we were very happy to see him, but we were quite disappointed that he decided to show himself literally as soon as the show had finished. So I'm heading back to exactly where we saw him and hoping that he might pop his head out. Anthony, who is eight years old, thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Um, generally, the leopards that do come into camp, um, like Hosanna, he's very um, relaxed around people and he won't hurt anybody, no. Just, well, all we do is we take our bright torches with us and if we see a leopard, we just shine in his eyes and then we can go in our room very quietly. Now, there's lots of impala around here, so that tells me that he's not here. So, Anthony, we don't nearly, really need to worry too much. We don't... Um, uh, just walk around without a light. We must go around with the torch. That is very important. So we must be very careful because they are dangerous animals. But um, if we just follow those small little rules, we'll be fine. And uh, we don't need to worry too much about Osana. He's, uh, he's a very kind cat to us. He likes being around people. He's often in this area. And, um, well, I'm trying to find him now. I'm actually going to turn around because I'm going to land back with Steve and Steve can be on his own now with those lions. I'm still looking. Sorry for the dust. That's just from us on the road. Okay, so it seems my search here is being a little bit unsuccessful, but I'm going to continue on. In the meantime, off to Steve who is still with those beautiful lions. Yes, we are indeed, and the minutes are counting down. And uh, James had them calling in the last moments of drive the other day. But I think that was before we had the half an hour earlier shift. So I think they might be waiting for quarter past six South African time before they bellow out their calls. Hello Lily, age 7. You want to know a very interesting question of whether these males returned because the evokers are calling and I have no doubt that is what happened. They heard the challenge from a very long way away and they came charging. Now I'm wondering if there was more than two or if all four of them came up. Uh, they seem to spend a lot of time together, these cats. As I mentioned, the coalition is only as strong as its weakest link. And if they came up with just two, maybe that's how confident they are. Um, James was discussing it the other day on the, on the Saturday show that these cats, these boys, by, have been in a lot of scraps. You can see it by their face. You can see it by just their entire attitude. They've seen a lot of action. And the evokers have come in with a little bit of arrogance, I would say, probably not having too many scraps. Their faces don't look too battle-scarred. 
and they've come in and they thought they've claimed a territory and they have been calling i don't know where they are at the moment and these males have come back to try and oust the challenges um, and i have no doubt that those of you who are watching the dam cam this evening especially with the audio that it produces will be listening closely to these boys as they wake up and announce their presence in juma because if you didn't know what juma meant it is the roar of the lion it's been a marvelous afternoon with the monkeys alarm calling to show us the way we had planned to head to chitwa for some action and uh, we only got a minute out of camp before hearing the monkeys and as you know i've told you my most reliable alarm call is monkeys and kudu or uh, nyala and there we go we had the male lions coming in and it amazes me how far the monkeys saw them from but from brent and the walking team they saw some amazing tracks and spiders no other cats this afternoon from the tracker team or the or ralph himself but it has been a marvelous afternoon from everybody here we've enjoyed the questions and the commentary and thank you to from fc and all of you at home please join us again early tomorrow morning for another show on safari live have a beautiful night we'll see you then